is a partly cloudy, windy, and chilly afternoon here at the Yale Bowl in New Haven, Connecticut, where today the Yale Bulldogs play host to the Big Red of Cornell in a very important Ivy League game. Harvard begins the day in first place in the Ivy League with a record of 4-1, and one, but Cornell and Yale, the two teams that will take the field here today, just a half game behind, with records of 3-1. and one. The winner of today's game will move into a tie with Harvard for first place because the Crimson play outside the league against Holy Cross this afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody, from the new press box high atop the Yale Bowl. I'm Sean McDonough, along with Jack Corrigan and Mike Madden. A fire this summer destroyed the former press box here at the Yale Bowl, so they are still under construction with the new one. We've donned the hard hats as construction takes place all around us right up until game time. But much more important, the football game today, with serious implications on the Ivy League title race. It's Yale and Cornell, Jack, two different teams, two different philosophies. Different philosophies, particularly offensively and defensively. Yale's offense under Carm Cozy, the I formation, is somewhat predictable in terms of when they line up in a certain formation, they tend to do X number of things, so you can prepare for that defensively. They're still effective, however, doing that, obviously by the fact that they've won their last four ball games in a row. Cornell defensively likes to do lots of different things. They blitz a great deal. They give the offensive line many different fronts to try and confuse their blocking schemes. Whichever one of those two philosophies is more effective today, that's going to be the difference in the ballgame. Cornell coach Maxie Bond said earlier this week that he was bringing his team down to New Haven by ambulance. His big red team has been decimated by injuries, but as the week has gone along, Mike, it's Yale that has come up with some injuries as well. Well, they have. They lost Troy Jenkins this week, and they lost their right tackle, Art Coleman. So that, that should hurt their offense a little bit. Maxie, though he had these injuries, he is kind of pleased in that he's getting a lot of these guys back but he's still going to be without Chris Hahn, his all Ivy League wide receiver, and Mike Texedo, their standout defensive end. He's getting some of these guys back, but he's still without some key people, and it, it remains to be seen how these teams will, will play with uh, some injured guys. It seems that the injury scale is now even on both sides. Both sides will be without key performers this afternoon in this very important Ivy League game. And we'll be back at the Yale Bowl in just a moment. The Ivy League football game of the week is made possible by a grant from the financial professionals at Payne Weber. And by a grant from Chrysler Plymouth. We're working together to be the best. We are just about set to go here at the Yale Bowl. Yale dressed in their home blue uniforms, won the toss and elected to defer their decision until the second half. Cornell elected to receive. They are dressed in their visiting white. Yale will kick off, but an important factor here, Jack, in the first quarter. Yale will have a very strong breeze behind their back that gusts up to 30 miles an hour. And with two pass-oriented teams, that could be a factor in the game today. With this bowl that you have in the sunken playing field, there's a definite wind blowing from left to right as people view this game. But actually, down on the field, it is a swirling situation. It's going to be tough uh, no matter if you're going with the wind or against the wind this afternoon. Number 19, Jonathan Gastel will kick off for the Bulldogs of Yale, and we're just about set to go. Deep, along with Steve Lutz for Cornell, numbers 37 and 41, respectively. Line drive kick taken at the four yard line. Steve Lutz trying to get outside to the left, and he cannot. He's taken down hard at the 22 yard line. Pete Helen made the tackle on special teams for Yale, and Dave Dassey, number eight, leads Cornell out on offense. Skilled people, Dave Dassey, the junior quarterback, as a good fullback in Scott Malaga with the injury to Chris Hahn. Sean Hawkins will be a big target along with St Sam Brickley when he comes off the bench. First and 10, Cornell going into the win, beginning at their own 22 yard line. High formation, and the handoff goes to the tailback number four, Marvin Dunklin. He stopped after a very short game by number 40, Don Lund inside linebacker junior from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The Yale defense, which has improved week by week, headed up by Tony Capolino, a defensive end, and the two linebackers, John Reese, number 32, and Don Lund, number 40, the leading tacklers for this team. Yale this afternoon, the first time in the 23 years that Carm Coase has been the head coach, all the secondary, just sophomores. 
Eight of one on the play, second and nine. Dave Dassey, the quarterback, a junior from Orinda, California. Hands it off to Todd Ryman, number 43. Big hole, and he pulls across the 30, close to a first down at the 32-yard line. Ryman's a converted tight end, began the year as a tight end, was a linebacker last year. Now he's a fullback. Excellent block by Mark Warrington, the junior tight end, number 88, as he knocked down Tony Capolino, Yale's fine defensive end, to give Ryman the room to pick up the first down. First and 10 Cornell just underway. First quarter here at the Yale Bowl in New Haven, Connecticut. Yale comes in having won four in a row, their longest winning streak since 1981. Tassie again hands it off to Ryman. All of the yardage on first down for Ryman who lost the football but it was after he was down. He goes down at the 39 after a gain of seven. Big Lee Rearman number 76 the right tackle offensively for Cornell second team all Ivy player missed all of practice this week after being scratched in the eye in the ball game last Saturday against Bucknell but he is their key up front when they move the ball on the ground. Second down three. Two minutes play, first quarter, no score. Scott Maliga has the first down as he slides out to the 44. Maliga comes in as the leading rusher for Cornell, 466 yards on the season, averaging 3.7 yards per carry. Interesting play calling by Cornell, although not overly surprising in terms of that strong wind in their face here in the first quarter. And much like Dartmouth tried to do against Yale last week, Sean, they want to control the ball, keep Kelly Ryan on the sidelines. As you saw, there is only one other game on the schedule today. That involves two Ivy League teams going head to head. That's Dartmouth at Columbia, the rest of the league playing outside the league. Dassey on, out into the flat, it's complete. Sam Brickley makes the catch. He's out of bounds at the 46 yard line of Yale. Just shy, it appears, of a first down. Brickley's having a great year. Leading receiver in the Ivy League. That's his 41st catch of the season. Impressive opening drive here by the Big Red as they have stuck it to a Yale defense that has been shutting people down over the last several weeks. Gain of nine, second down less than a yard. The catch by Brickley, the junior from Landenburg, Pennsylvania. First down for Cornell, picked up by Malaga. He was tripped up after crossing the 45-yard line. Got ahead for about two. Tony Capolino, number 51, made the tackle, the senior defensive end from New Hyde Park, New York. Part of the reason for moving Todd Ryman into the backfield is that the Big Red was really without a, an authentic blocking back. Ryman gives them that and has not done a bad job running the ball. He was the lead blocker there for Malaga. Marvin Dunklin back in the backfield now for Cornell. They're in the I formation behind Dassey. Dunklin gets the pitch. He's across the 40 and down at the 39 yard line. Cornell showing up yardage behind this injured offensive line you saw there as Dunklin turned the corner. Really, no blue shirts in sight. Cornell is really getting off the ball well here in the initial series. They've got Mark Burden in at left guard replacing the injured Doug Davis. And that, with the exception of Rehrman at right tackle, is an all-junior offensive line. So that bodes well for the future. Second down, five. 11.35 to play. First quarter, no score. Ryman. Driven out of bounds by Don Lund, number 40, at the 35-yard line, about a yard shy of a first down. Lund's been a standout defensively for Yale this season. Second leading tackler. Came in with 96 total tackles, 13 last week against Dartmouth. The Yale defense is a typical odd man front in which you expect the bulk of your tackles to be made by the linebackers. Lund has 96 tackles coming into today. John Reese has 102 tackles. Down one. Just outside the 35. The toss to Mitchell Lee, number 23. He doubles as the starting middle linebacker for the Big Red, and he has the first down as he pulled down to the 33-yard line. 
sort of the Gordy Lockbaum of the Ivy League, Mitchell Lee, for Coach Maxie Vaughn. Maxie's got his baby bull backfield when he puts Mitchell Lee in the ball game with Malaga and Ryman, three kids who enjoy contact. Mitchell Lee's uh, been a very pleasant player for them, just what they wanted, and probably a little more since this is just his sophomore year. First and ten, Cornell on the move. This drive began at the big red 22. There's the 32 again. Malaga puts his head down, took a hit from Capolino. Not after he crossed the 30 and went down to the 27-yard line for a gain of nearly six. One advantage for Cornell in this football game this afternoon is that on the line of scrimmage, they are much bigger than Yale. Cornell across the front line goes 260, 240, 245, 240, 275. The Yale defensive front is much smaller. All kinds of motion for the Big Red and just one back left in the backfield. On second and five, Massey looking for the quick hitter and he overthrows Sam Brickley in the flat. Don Lund on the coverage. That'll bring up a third down and five, and Cornell has not really been faced with a third and medium yardage situation thus far in this drive. They've been picking up the first downs with relative ease. Cornell's problem this year, Sean, has not been, and, and when you're four and three and three and one in the Ivies, you're still doing a lot of things right, but their problem has been when they get down into the scoring zone, finishing things off, particularly inside the 20. Third down and five from the 27 of Yale. 10 21 to play in a scoreless first quarter. Marvin Buckman on the sweep. Put his head down and got stopped at the 25, short of a first down. Steve Essick over there in on the tackle, along with number 44, Richard Huff. Chris Rutan also in there. Malaga leading the way, cannot get all of Rutan, and then Huff coming up from his cornerback spot with a good hit. Like we told you, that secondary with the injury to Dave Sullivan, all sophomores. First time that's ever happened for Carmcoza, and he's been the head coach here for a long time. Rutan 44, Huff 45, making the big stop and forcing Cornell into a field goal attempt. Dave Quarles, this is a 42-yarder. It would match his longest of the season. Into the wind, does it have it up? It does, but it's wide to the right. Dave Quarles was 10 of 14. Before that field goal try, he's now 10 of 15. His 10 field goals on the year, a Cornell single season record, but he cannot build on that record. And an impressive drive by the Big Red falls short. Scenes of the Yale campus as we continue showing you some of the famous alumni from the respective schools playing here this afternoon. And we'll get a first look at that Yale offense. Which begins first and 10 at its own 25-yard line. Kelly Ryan, the captain of the Bulldogs, number six at quarterback. He airs it out on the first play, and it's complete out at the 45-yard line. Pass caught by Tom Zuba, number 27, the leading receiver for Yale. That's his 33rd catch of the year. Yale offense headed up by Kelly Ryan. All-time best for Yale in total offense and passing yardage. You see Kevin Bryce, the fullback, with the absence of Troy Jenkins, their outstanding blocking fullback, out with some nerve damage in his shoulder. Gain of 20 on the first play from scrimmage for Yale. Bryan pitches it back to Mike Stewart, Yale's leading rusher. He's out to the midfield stripe after gain of five. Stewart's a junior from Manchester, New Hampshire. He was tackled by Rick Calhoun, number 97. Cornell defensively, Dave Pollan in there for the injured Mike Taxedo. Stewart Tross, their best pass rusher. Rinkus, an all-Ivy player. Good linebacking core and a good secondary that is also a little bit banged up. Danelle Johnson in at cornerback and Corky Webb replacing the injured Brent Polito. Kelly Ryan, senior from Springfield, Illinois, hands off to Kevin Bryce and he stumbled. Got back just about to the line of scrimmage. Len Tokus, number 81, fell on top of Bryce. You mentioned the injury to Troy Jenkins as you look at the career numbers for Kelly Ryan. He is Yale's all-time leading passer with those 3,358 yards coming in. You can add 20 on the completion to Zuba. But Troy Jenkins' loss, I think, is minimized by the fact that they have Kevin Bryce to fill in, and he was second-team All-Ivy player last year, the leading rusher for the Bulldogs a year ago. Certainly from a running perspective, but Bryce is just not the blocker that Jenkins is. Third down, five for Yale on their first offensive possession. They're at midfield. 
Ryan over the middle and complete to Rich Schulte, number eight. He has a first down at the Cornell 36. Cornell was in a defense in which they rolled up the cornerbacks to put pressure on and had the two safeties. Schulte put an excellent move on Donnell Johnson and had him leaning the wrong way. And when he curled in underneath the strong safety, Jeff DeLamalure, he was open for the completion in the first down. Catch number seven of the season for Rich Schulte. He came in with six receptions on 71 yards, and he's a senior from Miami, Florida. Yale now on the move, first and 10 at the Cornell 36. Stewart gets the handoff. And he's forward down to the 33 for a gain of about three. Stewart coming off an impressive performance last week, 138 yards against Dartmouth and one touchdown. He's ahead of a 1,000-yard pace for the season. Comes into this ball game as the number five rusher in the nation in one double A. There you see his all-purpose numbers, which puts him number two in the Ivy League behind Judd Garrett. Cornell moves from its 22-yard line down to the Yale 25 on its first possession before having a field goal attempt go wide. Yale has moved from its 25 down to the Cornell 31 now as Kevin Bryce goes forward for about two. Bryce, a junior from Chicago, Illinois. Third down, about five upcoming for Yale. Yale comes in with a record of five and two overall. Three and one of the Ivy League, winners of four straight. Cornell four and three overall, three and one of the Ivy League, and a loser last week against Bucknell by a score of 20 to six. Ryan has the rush coming, goes deep to the end zone. It is incomplete. Off the hands of the tight end, Dean Athanasia, he doesn't drop money, many, and that looked like a catchable ball from here, Jack. Beautifully thrown ball by Kelly Ryan. He rolled one way, and like they do so often, they throw back against the grain. This time, Athanasia going for it all. He was behind Corky Webb. He just didn't catch it. Their favorite play is then he will break over the middle. That's what he faked there and went deep. He had Webb beaten in defense of Dean Athanasia. The wind certainly affected. You could see his eyes shifting as that ball shifted in the air. Yale's field goal game, deficient at best, so they're going for it on fourth and five. Ryan throws, it is caught by Zuba along the sideline, and he appears to have a first down at the 25-yard line. Needed to get to the 27, he does have a first down on the catch for Tom Zuba, the junior from Sewickley, Pennsylvania. Kelly Ryan, mobile this year, no knee problems. He was able to beat contain, and a little bit of a pick play there. Happens many times, but Zuba took advantage of it, made another clutch catch. On fourth and five, the Bulldogs convert. It's first and 10 at the Cornell 25. No score, six minutes to play, first quarter. Kelly Ryan throws over the head of Zuba, his intended target. Zuba now with 34 catches on the season with his two today. He's within reach, but he'll have to move of the single season Yale reception record, which is 51 catches set by Kurt Grieve in 1981. That's an amazing note on Kelly Ryan. Has not been sacked or thrown an interception since the loss to Hawaii back on the 3rd of October. That's five games. And they have put 40, 27, 28, and 17 points on the board in the four victories since that Hawaii game. Second and 10 from the Cornell 25. Bulldogs blitz. Stewart gets the call up the middle, and he's wrapped up by Mitchell Lee after a short gain of about three yards. I think what we are seeing early on here from Seb Laspina, the offensive coordinator for Yale, is a realization that they are not going to run the ball as well today for two reasons, the absence of Troy Jenkins and also the fact that Cornell is very tough to run against. They have allowed only 124 yards a game on the ground. See Carm goes and Seb Laspina there with the headset. He's the offensive coordinator for Yale, and he's been with Carm all the way. 23 years as an assistant coach at Yale for Seb Laspina. And looks again, it's dumped off and complete to Bob Shoup, number 17. He's out of bounds near the 15-yard line and near first down. Bob Shoup, senior from Oakmont, Pennsylvania. Cornell with the blitz. We told you about that at the beginning of the ball game, that they would 
throw lots of blitzes and Ryan anticipating it through the quick out pattern. And just shy of the 15 was Bob Shoot. So it's another fourth down try for the Bulldogs. Fourth and less than a yard, and they're going to go for it again. As I mentioned a moment ago, Yale's field goal unit is deficient. Stewart has the first down. Tried to spin it in the end zone, and he's wrapped up in the six-yard line. Mike Rage made a touchdown saving tackle, number 13, for Cornell. Cornell was gambling with some stunning. Watch number 23, Mitchell Lee. Looks like he's in position to make the play, but he is bumped off on a great block on the outside linebacker by Dean Athanasia. He ended up taking two men out of the play. I thought for a second, Sean, that Lee had an angle to make a stop on Stewart, but Athanasia with the big block. Mike Stewart has had four 100-yard-plus games this season. Off to a good start this afternoon, and the Bulldogs lock out of the door at the six. Bryce crosses the five and spins down to the three. Rach again in on the tackle, along with Mark Bond, number 55, son of Coach Maxie Bond, a senior from Ithaca, New York. Mark Bond interned on Wall Street this past summer. It was probably a much happier time in that neck of the woods over the summer than it is right now. No score, first quarter. 4.20 remaining and the clock running. Yale with second and goal from the three. Psychology major Kelly Ryan calling the signals. Pitches it to Stewart and he is down to the goal line and not in, say the officials. They say he hit just shy of the goal line and rolled in and it's third and goal from the six inch line for Kelly Ryan and the Yale Bulldogs. The fans here at the bowl don't like it, but that was a good call by the official. Mitchell Lee popped Stewart, and the ball did not cross the plane of the goal line. He bounced it in, so they'll have to try it again on third down. I'll tell you what, Kevin Bryce is not doing a bad job blocking. Big hit by Lee, and you see, see the excellent call by the official. Third and goal. Ryan on the keeper. No signal yet from the officials. And it appears that they're going to spot the quarterback just short. And they will. It will be fourth and goal. And you can't get much closer than that. Gary Rink is the co-captain in the all-Ivy defensive tackle, submarining through there to make it a little tougher on Kelly Rank. He had some problems on the exchange from center. There's Cornell. Rink is number 91. The big red trying to stop. Yeah, they've done that a couple of times this year. Stop people on the goal line. Fourth and goal. Ryan hands it off to Stewart. Touchdown! drive by the Yale Bulldogs a couple of fourth down conversions they convert here on third down at the goal line Lee met Stewart but Stewart a little bit higher in the collision and his momentum put him into the end zone this is a great look watch Mitchell Lee up over the top but he couldn't quite get high enough and Stewart over him for the score Dave Derby on to try the extra point it was nearly blocked but makes it through Derby's had trouble in that area this year. He's missed three PAT, 16 before 19 before that, but now he's 17 for 20. And with 2.47 to play in the first quarter, Yale has a 7 0 lead over Cornell. Handsome Dan, the Yale mascot. That's Handsome Dan the 13th. He's handsome indeed. Friendly fella. An impressive drive as we indicated for the Yale Bulldogs. They went 75 yards in 11 plays. In 16 plays, they tell us. We'll correct that. Took nearly seven minutes off the clock. The touchdown coming on the third down plunge by Mike Stewart. As he was able to get up and over Mitchell Lee. Watch the collision again in the air. Stewart just got a little bit higher than Mitchell Lee did. 
And that catapulted him into the end zone. Jonathan Gastella, senior from Rochester, New York, number 19 to kick off. Short kick. Steve Lutz runs up, fields it at the 11. Lutz crosses the 25, had a gap, and made his way out to the 32-yard line. Dave Dassey moved Cornell in impressive fashion on the first drive of the day for the Big Red from their 22 down to the 25 of Yale before a missed field goal resulted in the end of that drive. Yale came right back with that scoring drive. 16 plays, 75 yards, a good balance of running and passing. They consumed 6 minutes and 45 seconds, and Stewart capped it off with his seventh touchdown of the season and his fifth touchdown rushing. From six inches out, 7-0 Yale after the extra point by Derby. Dassey to throw on first down. Throws in the flat to Ryman. Moved away from Capolino, but still stopped behind the line of scrimmage. And Steve Essick, number nine, and Don Lund, number 40, came up to finish off with Tony Capolino started. This was basically a secondary play, even though Capolino gets credit for making a nice tackle. It was coverage downfield that forced Dassey to dump the ball off to Todd Ryman. There just was nobody open downfield. Loss of five on the play. It's second down and 15. Breeze has died down a bit. Flag more or less hanging limply down the pole. High formation behind Dassey in a long count. And time expires. Too long a count for Dave Dassey, and that'll be a five-yard walk-off against the Big Red. Back-to-back -back problems for the Big Red. Bob Fee, the referee. The indication on the delay of game penalty. So after seeing the other team march down the field and score, the first thing you don't want to do on offense is start moving backwards, but that's what the Big Red has done here. Second and 20. We should point out that it was referee Bob Fee's decision not to wear our microphone today, so we will not be able to hear his calls. Maxi Bond concerned here in the early going. He was the defensive coordinator for the Lions for three years before going to Ithaca. Second and 20. Draw play. Maligan and Wells just to get back to the line of scrimmage. He might not have done that. They're going to mark him down at the 20, a loss of about two. Lover Lawrence, a reserve defensive tackle, number 73. A junior from Portland, Oregon, made the tackle. Interesting. The first series for Cornell, they ran the ball effectively and moved it downfield. They tried the pass on first down and lost yardage, then had the delay of game, and now all of a sudden they're up against it, and the Yale defense looks much more aggressive. I want to point out that Dave Dassey has been known to quick kick in long yardage situations on third down. He's done it four times this year. He's not going to do it here. Under pressure, throws over the middle, wide open, Mike Reddy. He is very close to a first down at the 42-yard line. It will depend on where they spot his forward progress. I think he's going to be just shy. He will be. And Cornell probably will be forced to punt as you watch it again. Capolino bearing in on Dossi, but he releases it. And Mike Reddy, a reserve wide receiver, stopped shy of the first down because of the good hit by Rich Huff. Capolino was lowering the boom on Dossi and hit him just after Dave threw. Yale has to use a timeout here. Cornell came out, lined up to punt, but of course, as you see Tom Coburn, the punter there, with just about a half yard to go for the first down, there would have been the possibility of a fake punt there, and Yale was sort of between a special team and a defensive unit out there. They didn't have all the people they wanted, so they chose to burn a timeout and make certain on what they were doing. But Rich Huff, who did such an excellent job last week of shutting down Craig Morton, Darkness' outstanding wide receiver, has come up twice here in the first quarter with big open field tackles. The third down tackle on Cornell's first drive that ended up with Cornell missing a field goal, and then the big hit there on Mike Reddy that stopped the Big Red from getting a first down. That's our game next week, and Harvard will have a share of the Ivy League lead as they host Penn next week. The Crimson with just one loss on the season, and that was a dramatic one at the hands of the Cornell Big Red several weeks ago on our Ivy League Game of the Week up in Ithaca. Harvard will come in with one loss, a record of 4-1, and one, and either Cornell or Yale will be 4-1 unless the two teams play to a tie today. That would really throw a monkey wrench into the Ivy League Don't even pitcher. bring up those kinds of things. 
Coben in the pot, a sophomore from Mendham, New Jersey. Bob Shoup back to receive it for Yale. Good kick into the breeze, and Shoup calls for a fair catch and makes it at the 24-yard line. That's where Yale comes out on offense for the second time. With 17 seconds left in the first quarter, and the Bulldogs leading by a score of 7 to nothing, a punt of 34 yards and no return. Dave Dassey, we should point out, did not play last week against Bucknell in the Big Red loss to Bucknell. He suffered a concussion two weeks ago in the Dartmouth game, but has been medically cleared to play today. Moved the Big Red effectively on the first drive, not so on that second drive. yard line gain of 20 right off the bat instant replay of the first drive and how it began for Yale as Zuba makes a 20 yard reception for a first down Yale is doing a very effective job of finding the hole in the zone Zuba got beyond the underneath people and ahead of the deep people you see Corky Webb coming up to make the hit but not before Yale got more good territory good <laughs> Time out here. <laughs> they moved it up the field nicely. Yes, How's that? There we 20 go. 20 yards <laughs> and a first down, and Yale leads 7 to nothing at the end of one quarter of play. A quarter dominated by long drives by each side. Cornell began at its own 22 on the first possession of the day, moved down to the Yale 25 yard line, went for the field goal by Dave Quarles of 42 yards, and it was wide right. The Yale started at the 25, used 16 plays. And scored, consuming six minutes and 45 seconds off the clock. Stewart scoring the touchdown for one yard out, seven nothing to score. Yale just on offense for the second time. We are seeing once again, as we have in previous telecasts in which we've had the Bulldogs on, how effective Yale is offensively because they are so balanced offensively. They come into this ball game averaging 200 yards a game passing, 180 yards a game running. You can't be much more balanced than that, and that's why they've won four games in a row and been so effective offensively. Through their first seven games, Yale has outgained each of its opponents with the exception of Hawaii. They outgained Brown in their loss to the Bruins by 70 yards. They outgained the University of Connecticut by 120 yards. And right down the list, William and Mary was outgained by Yale. Columbia decidedly outgained. Penn and Dartmouth all outgained by the Yale Bulldog offense, which faces first and 10 from its own 45. Ryan has Stewart all alone in the flat. He's across midfield. Stiff arms Mike Rach and picks up a first down at the Cornell 43. Mike Stewart making the catch, and he had all kinds of running room out in front of him. A little bit of a wrinkle on the look that Yale likes to give you of rolling one way and throwing back to another. Wow, look at that score. Boston College is out ahead of Notre Dame. The Eagles trying to make it two upsets in a row after knocking off highly ranked Tennessee last week. That game is out in South Bend, Indiana today between the Eagles. The mobility of Kelly Ryan makes this Yale offense so difficult to defense. by Donnell Johnson. It went off the hands of Dean Athanasia. Johnson trying to move along the sideline and does out to about the 41-yard line. They'll spot him out at the 40. Donnell Johnson with the interception, his second of the season. Second time this afternoon that Yale's fine tight end, Dean Athanasia, had a ball go off his hands. He couldn't hang on to a touchdown try. This one zaps off his hands, and Donnell Johnson is there for the interception. The Cornell defense has now picked off 13 passes this year as Donnell Johnson gets his second of the season. He's a senior from Los Angeles, California. Start of the season as a reserve. Mark Perlman was the starting quarterback, but Johnson has taken over the starting job and done well. First to 10 Cornell with the big red 40. Dassey with the win at his back here in the second quarter. Locks it and it is caught by Malaga. A fine juggling catch out at the 44 yard line. Just a gain of four, but Scott Malaga worked hard to pick up that yardage. 
Bessie was looking upfield for Steve Lutz when he was covered. Malaga was the release man. These guys, they must spend time juggling. We had Sean Hawkins doing the juggling act in that dramatic win against Harvard, and there's Malaga hanging on. Well, you work those ball drills, and now you know why. One-handed grab by Malaga as he was going down. Malaga gets the call rushing and gets ahead for about two. They'll spot him down at the 46, and that'll set up third down and four. While the offense tries to move down the field defensively, Peter Noyes, the defensive coordinator for the Big Red, plotting strategy for the next time Kelly Ryan and company are on the field for Yale. Get the depth, and now make a break into that football. You got what I'm saying? And I got to get you in the phone with Coach Coach again. All right, now the big thing that Coach Bond is saying is play the defense. Play ball under. The offense faces third and four, trailing seven to nothing. 13 minutes to play till halftime. Dassey throws over the middle, incomplete. It was intended for Steve Lutz. Bob Stokes, number 29, was on the coverage, and that sets up a punt situation for the Big Red. Tom Coven back out on the field for the second time. His first punt traveled 34 yards. Lutz was looking for a flag. He thought he was bumped by Bob Stokes, but I think it was just good, tight coverage. Breeze has died a bit. It is still at the back of Tom Coven. Nine men up on the line of scrimmage for Yale. Seven seconds left on the play clock. And it's a high short kick. And flags come down as they interfered with the opportunity to make the catch by Bob Shoup. That'll be a five-yard walk-off against the Big Red. Have to give them two yards in college football. And Clearly, Shoup's face was violated. Ball as it was dying and Shoup was coming up on it, and Evan Park and Lee Rehrman were a little too tight. Bob B with the call, as Sean mentioned, you have to have at least two yards of space. And as you see Bob Shoup catch the ball here, he Lee Rehrman <laughs> is right there along with Mark Burden. It's a five-yard walk-off. Yale will be over its 30, just beyond the 31, as they start their third drive of the day. Shoup did well just to catch that ball. From the 31, first to 10, Yale. The Bulldogs lead 7 to nothing. Mike Stewart doesn't get anywhere. Mark Bond, number 55, came up to make the tackle. Coach's son, the senior business management major, has played very well this year. Cornell has a load of talent in the linebacking core. Mike Farley, a senior, had been starting most of the year, beaten out by Mitchell Lee, but Farley's a good football player, and Tokish and Mark Vaughn, Len Tokish and Mark Vaughn have shared one of the outside spots. Mike McGran, the other outside linebacker. Second and 10. 12-10 to play, second quarter. Ryan lost the football and falls on it at the 30-yard line. Lost a yard on the play, but more importantly, he kept the football. Coming up at halftime, Jack Corrigan has a conversation with Yale's all-time leading passer and their captain, Kelly Ryan. That was a strange play. Everybody was moving. Even Kelly was at first. It, it looked like he took two steps before he realized he didn't have the ball in his hands. Now, they've been effective in terms of converting in long yardage, third and fourth down situations. This is their most difficult one to date. Third and 11 from the 30. Ryan rolls right, looking for Zuba, and he's tackled and sacked behind the line of scrimmage by Dave Poland, number 94, the sophomore from Portland, Oregon, his first sack of the season. He was trying to go downfield to Tom Zuba. Zuba working a little hook route around the first down marker, and you could see Jeff DeLamalore had slid in right underneath him, and meanwhile, Pollen was making the good stop on Kelly Ryan to force a Yale punt deep in their own territory. Todd Cowan on the punt for Yale. He's had trouble this season. His average just 28.8 yards per punt. This is a high kick for short, fielded by Mike Rach at the 45-yard line, and the flag comes down there. Perhaps his face was violated by the Yale coverage team. 
Same situation again. The ball was short and the coverage downfield. A little bit too anxious. It was only a 24 yard punt and Cornell will get five more of that back. Let's go down to Mike Madden right here. After that last series, Yale's defensive team came over here and I saw something you don't normally see on the sideline. The coach gathered them all up and he was telling them what a heck of a job they're all doing. He says that series was fantastic. They're playing the defense. They want to contest every run and contest every pass. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but that's what he's telling his guys. <laughs> well, Mike's absolutely right about that. Usually, no matter how good the offense or defense is doing, the coaches are usually hollering at them and have something negative to say to keep them on their toes. On first down, Dassey down the middle, complete. Mike Reddy made the catch, and he's inside the 20. Second catch of the afternoon for the senior from Medway, Massachusetts. And Cornell knocking on the door, trying to tie this one up as they are down deep into Yale territory. Good touch pass here by Dassey. Right between the linebackers, Reese and Lund, perfectly thrown to Mike Reddy. First and 10, Cornell from the 17-yard line. Mark Warrington was the tight end. He resets at the left end of the line. High formation behind Dassey. The pitch goes to Marvin Duncan. The senior ran into his own blocker but managed to bounce forward for about two. Dunklin's from Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania. A general studies major at Cornell. Never scored a touchdown in his collegiate career. Mark Burden, the man he bumped into, is in the starting lineup in place of Doug Davis, the normal left guard for the Big Red, who is out with an injury. Yale leads 7 0. Less than 10 minutes to play till halftime. Second down and eight for Cornell. Looking to tie the score. They're at the 15. Dassey got hit as he throws it, and it falls incomplete, short of his intended target, Steve Lutz, Steve Essick, and Chris Rutan on the coverage. Good pressure put on by Glover Lawrence, number 73, a defensive tackle, and Don Lund, a blitzing linebacker. Lawrence is a history major from Portland, Oregon, a junior. Dad also a Yaley, class of 65. Glad to see Glover out there and playing well after missing all of last year with a back injury. Glover Lawrence was our spotter here two years ago when he was a member of the freshman football team. Third down and eight. From the 15, Yale shows blitz, and they do blitz. Reese was picked up. Dassey lobs to the end zone. And it's incomplete. Lutz and Rutan got tangled up, but no flags coming down. And the field goal team comes on for the second time for Cornell. Lutz was making an adjustment on this pass, and he just lost his footing. Otherwise, I think he would have cut inside of Rutan and made the catch. But his feet slipped out from underneath him, and that cost the Big Red perhaps a touchdown. 32-yard field goal attempt upcoming for Dave Quarles from the left hash mark. Aaron Samita, the backup quarterback, is holding. Quarles missed earlier from 42. Low line drive might have been blocked, and it's no good. Quarles 0 for 2, and Cornell still being shut out by Yale at 7 0 with 9.32 to play till halftime. This is what has plagued the Big Red this season. They are averaging only 15 points of all game. Quarles. Just a low line. I think he just mishit it. Rich Huff was putting pressure on. I just think he mishit it. Dave Quarles last week kicked two field goals against Bucknell, accounting for their six points in a 20 to 6 loss to the Bison. The previous school record of nine field goals was set by Tom Ogg last year. Interesting man in the news these days. Douglas Ginsburg. Yale begins first and 10 from the 20. Mike Stewart in a crowd and does well to get a yard. Stewart Tross in on the tackle for Cornell along with Dave Poland, number 94. Yale trying to run a little misdirection. They had the quarterback action going right and then pulled the right guard and right tackle to come back to the left side, but the Cornell defense was waiting for Mike Stewart. See his Ivy League numbers. He's a couple of more yards per game overall this year. On second and nine, Ryan Rose spot by Zuba. He has the first down at the 31 yard line. Mark Perlman made the tackle, number six. 
Tom Zuba has been a most pleasant surprise. The junior wing back from Sewickley, who is a pre-med major here, came in with 32 catches on the season. He has added three more here this afternoon. Just running up against zone coverage, and he got away from Jeff DeLamalore. Roman knocked him up, but not before. Zuba picked up 11 and a first down. Ryan on the run. Schulte wide open near midfield. He's dropped to the 48-yard line. Pick up of 17 on the second catch of the afternoon for Rich Schulte. First down Yale, and the Bulldogs once again on the move. Excellent throw by Kelly Ryan. We've talked about this before. When a right-handed quarterback moves to his left, it is much more difficult to throw the ball with some zip on it. But watch how Kelly Ryan squares up his shoulders right there to be able to get his body behind that throw and drill it to Schulte. On first and ten. Ryan over the middle. Complete to Athanasia in Cornell territory at the 33-yard line. And a penalty flag comes down on the tackle. First catch of the day after a tough start for Athanasia, who's dropped two. One was right in his hands for a touchdown. And the other went off his hands and into the arms of Cornell's Donnell Johnson. But that one caught, and Athanasia was face masked at the end of the play. That'll add five yards. Move Cornell down to about the 28. An inadvertent face mask. There's the favorite pattern of the Bulldogs. They roll one way away from Athanasia, the tight end, and then he is underneath trailing the linebackers, and Ryan does an excellent job of finding him right between Len Tokish and Mike McGran. And somebody here reached out right there, Len Tokish grabbing the face mask. Five-yard penalty. From the 27, first to 10 for Yale, trying to build on a 7-0 lead. The toss to Stewart, in trouble in the backfield, and taken down behind the line of scrimmage. Number 99, Costa Harbalis, a sophomore from Watertown, reserve right tackle on defense for Cornell, made the play. That's just the second tackle of the season. Cornell defensively came up with a big turnover on the Donnell Johnson interception. The last time Yale was down in Big Red territory, they need to do something here again because their offense is sputtering on the scoreboard. 7-10 to play, second quarter. Ryan dumps it off, and it is incomplete. Corky Webb says, I picked it off, but the officials say no. And it's third down and about 11 upcoming for Karn Koza, Seb Laspina, and the Yale Bulldogs. First ball not well thrown by Kelly Ryan this afternoon. Corky Webb, did he come up with this ball? No. No, he did not. He trapped it underneath. Good call by the officials. You can see the side judge was in perfect position to make that call. A concerned Maxie Bond hoping his big red defense can come up with another big play. This is probably four down territory too, Sean, for Yale. Intended for Tom Zuba at about the 12-yard line. Would have been good for a first down. Pass well off the mark, and it's fourth down and 11, and I think you're right. Looks like Yale is going to go for it. Their field goal unit has not been successful this season. They picked just three field goals all year. They are three for three in this ball game on fourth down to this point, converting those to keep alive the touchdown drive in the first quarter. They're doing an awful lot of flooding the zones as well. They had the tight end plunk it short and Zuba deep on the last play. Let's see if they come back with something like that again. Fourth and 11. Straight back goes Ryan. Looking over the middle. Throwing over the middle. Completes Athanasia for the first down. Inside the 15-yard line. They'll spot him at the 13. A gain of 15. First and 10 Yale. Knocking on the door. Trying to build on a 7-0 lead. Cornell in zone coverage. Ryan gets excellent protection to sit back in the pocket. Athanasia curls in underneath. Corky Webb was there, but not before Athanasia had gotten first down yardage. That is the second catch of the day and catch number 100 of his career. 
for Dean Athanasia, Yale's all-time leading pass receiver. John Spagnola and Kurt Grieve are tied for second on Yale's all-time receiving list with 88 catches, so Athanasia is pulling away from the pack in substantial fashion. First and 10 from the 13. Athanasia's now caught at least one pass in 27 consecutive games. Stewart up the middle, inside the 10 and down at about the 7. Mike Stewart carrying for Yale. Gary Rinkus on stop for Cornell. Gain of about six, it will be second down and four. Gary Rinkus made the play defensively for Cornell. Six yards on the play, second and four. Another banner day for Kelly Ryan. He was 16 of 24 last week against Dartmouth. Up the middle. And short of a first down. Upton, the carrier for Darren Upton, who has come into the ball game at fullback for Yale. He apparently is a little bit stronger of a blocker than Kevin Bryce. One yard on the play, so they have sir. made that move with the absence of Troy Jenkins. Cornell with good pursuit that time. That's just the third carry of the season for Darren Upton, a senior from Dayton, Ohio, number 23. Big third down here for Yale, but as we point out, they may be in four down territory again, although this is certainly within their field goal range. Third and three from the six, Stewart has the first down as he is down at the two yard line. Well, there's a definite reason why Darren Upton's in the ball game, Sean McDonough. That young man did another excellent job of blocking on the corner along with Chris Plunk at the second tight end to give Stewart the room to pick up the first down. First and goal from the two. Mike Stewart on a 1,000-yard pace this season. And he owes a lot of that to blockers like Troy Jenkins and Darren Upton. Stewart trying to get outside. He does. And he's in for the touchdown. Mike Stewart for the Yale touchdown. Second touchdown of the day. Eighth of the season for Mike Stewart. And Yale leads 13 to nothing. 442 to play second quarter. There is no substitute for speed in the game of football. Cornell has got people there. Stewart just outruns them. You think he wanted the end zone? I Look think at that he effort. Did. Dave Derby on for the extra point. Out of the hole that Bob Reduce comes. It's good, and Yale leads 14-0 with 4.42 to play in the second quarter. The Cornell defense, which has not given up a lot of points this season, now faced with the task of trying to figure out a way to shut down the Yale offense as you look at graduates from both these schools. On the other side, the Yale defense has bent but not broken to this point as they have twice stiffened in their own territory and Cornell has been unsuccessful in field goal tries. What is slowly happening here as well, Sean, is probably feeling on the part of Cornell that they've got to start changing some things offensively perhaps throwing the ball a little more, trying to do things to get quicker points. They can't afford just to grind it out anymore because it hasn't worked for them, at least in terms of scoring points. Mike Stewart took last year off. The Yale coaches and fans awfully glad that he returned to action this season. From a football family, his dad, an assistant coach at Central Florida University and also an assistant athletic director. Jonathan Gastel to kick off into the wind. That has brought the Cornell return men, Lutz and Menego, up to the 10-yard line. They are not expecting a deep kick from the senior from Rochester, New York. Menego, number 37, on the bottom of your screen. Lutz at the top. Line drive kick. 
Out of the 30 yard line by Tim McDevitt, one of the up men. Cornell is going to have excellent field position. A fine play by McDevitt, who did well to catch that football without putting his knee down to the ground. He returned it 13 yards from the 30 to the 43. Cornell begins, trailing by 14 after the 12 play. 80-yard touchdown drive, which consumed four minutes and 50 seconds, capped by the touchdown run by Mike Stewart, just inside the three-yard line. You watch the play again by McDivitt. Just kept that left knee off the turf and made a decent return. Dassey throwing on first down and completing it to Sean Hawkins at the 45 of Yale. That's a first down. First catch of the day for Hawkins, the senior from Portland, Maine. That's his 15th catch of the season. He's a little slow to get up. Chris Hahn, he, uh, Cornell's All-Ivy receiver, already out with an injury and lost at the very least until the last game of the season against Princeton. Perhaps not even going to be available for that football game. From the 44, first and 10, Cornell. They moved the football effectively. Failed to score. They missed two field goals. Mike Reddy couldn't make the catch. That ball was thrown behind him. He almost did come up with an acrobatic grab. Cornell has plenty of time with 4.07 remaining here in the second quarter to get points on the board because they have their three timeouts. And, of course, in college football, every time you get a first down, the clock stops as well. So while they know they need to get points here in this first half, I think, Sean, they don't have to do it with, a, with an almost panic-like state. Sean McDonald along with Jack Morgan and Mike Penn at the Yale Bowl in New Haven, Connecticut. On second and ten, the pass is completed at the 40-yard line to Sam Brickley. Brickley, an economics and government major. Game of four, it'll bring up third down and six. Good crowd here. You see, Underneath the new, yeah, you we, see we the call it new. It's yes. not yet new, really. The ongoing. They say it will be ready by the game, the Harvard-Yale game, in a couple of weeks. Third down six for Cornell. Rickley went in motion. Dassey with lots of time. Throw downfield. Hawkins took a hit from Huff, and a penalty flag comes down. Might not have been interference, but it could have been unnecessary roughness as Huff delivered a blow to the head, it appeared, of Sean Hawkins. Either way, it will keep the drive alive. Bob Fee is going to indicate to us it is, it interference. is interference. You're right, Sean. Watch it again. I Hawkins. thought they hit him after the ball was gone, but I'm wrong as usual. That was kind of a tough hit. Well, it, it might have been Hansberry with hands on him, yeah, the up front guy, mm -hmm. and then Huff with the follow-up hit. But in any event, it's a first down for the Big Red at the Yale 25. Third time they have been inside the Yale 30 this afternoon. They've come away empty the previous two times on two missed field goals. Malaga crashes forward for about three. He got inside the 23-yard line. Jim D'Onofrio, the junior from North Merrick, New York, was the guy making the hit for the Bulldogs. Two yards on the play, second and eight. Good crowd today here at the Yale Bowl in New Haven. Looks perhaps a bit more sparse than it would in other stadiums because the capacity here is 71,000. Down to 2.48 to play, second quarter. Yale 14, Cornell nothing. Big Red on the move again. Passy going for the end zone, intercepted. Richard Huff has plenty of real estate along the sideline. Flags come down everywhere. Huff still on his feet and lost the football, and it's recovered by Cornell. What a hit. Steve Lutz. Steve Lutz just unloaded. There was a clip on Yale, and then when Huff cut back up field, Steve Lutz just buried him. And Doug Langan recovered for Cornell at the 15, and I think that's where they're going to get the football because they'll refuse the flipping penalty on the run back. Steve Lutz is staggering to the sidelines. I mean, he just crunched. Hawkins is open, and Dassey underthrows the ball. It You'll see the going down yeah. the sideline. He had a lot of room. Well, there's where the clip first occurred. Then as he bumped back this way, 
I don't know, we'll get it. There's the flag being thrown. Now watch this hit. Steve Lutz and Rich Hop. Boom. Oh my. And Doug Langan falls on the ball. A big break for Cornell. They have it first and 10 at the Yale 15, trailing 14 to nothing, 2.20 to play, first half. Maligan Dunklin the backfield. Dunklin takes the pitch. And gets down to about the 10 yard line for a gain of five. Steve Lutz answering questions, telling the officials and medical people along the Cornell sideline that he knows he's in New Haven and at the Yale Bowl. Here's the interception again. Watch all the real estate Huff had along the sideline, and he just ran straight ahead. I don't know if we'll see it from this angle, but he decided to cut it toward the middle of the field. And that's where he got himself in trouble and eventually ran into Steve Lutz like that. Hmm. From the 11, second and six. Yale shows blitz to the end zone, incomplete. Hawkins, the intended receiver, Huff broke it up. The interception for Richard Huff, the first of his Richard collegiate Huff, career, but I'm sure it won't be a pleasant memory after he popped up the football on the return. Yale showed blitz. Cornell picked it up. Hawkins was open. Huff just made a great play. He made an excellent play denying Sean Hawkins another touchdown. And he's had a lot in his big red career, 13 of them. Cornell down to 10 on the huddle clock. Down to five as Dassey moves under center. Two seconds, one second. And he tries to call the timeout. Do they give it to him? Yes, they do. Just as the clock was ticking zero, Dave Dassey called timeout, and the officials Second award it to him. This comes with a minute and 20 seconds to play. The game clock is still running. They let it tick down to 116 before the officials stop the game clock. Perhaps they'll put that time back on the clock. Holy Cross, number one Division I AA team of the country and leading Harvard 7-0, Lehigh over Brown 7-0 second quarter, and Colgate leads Princeton 13-0 in the first quarter. Penn with a victory, or uh, on the way to a victory, hopefully, over Lafayette, leading 10 to nothing, and Columbia hmm. in the second quarter trying to end their losing streak, leading Dartmouth 7-2. to And a three-run homer and a, a grand slam. That's right. right. <laughs> There's the big upset in the making. Boston College knocked off number 20 Tennessee last week. Important Southeast Conference game there with the Bulldogs on top and Michigan State on the way perhaps to the Rose Bowl in the Big Ten, particularly with Indiana now losing at Illinois, or to Illinois at home. The roar here at the Yale Bowl a moment ago came after they announced the Columbia Dartmouth score with Columbia leading Dartmouth 7-2. to two. That game is in New York City. Cornell is just one for five on third down here this afternoon after coming in with an efficiency of about 30% on third down. You saw Yale there with just two of seven, but they are four for four on fourth down. Clock still shows 116 to play. One of the officials came over to the sideline. And was on the telephone with the press box. I don't know if he was instructing him to put the four seconds back on the clock, but Dassey signaled timeout with 1.20 to play, and the clock ticked down an additional four or five seconds. With this press box undergoing construction, everything is more difficult. The print media and statistical people are in a canopy-like structure to the left of the new facility. I think what they're just going to do is keep the time on the field. There you see the scoreboard showing 116 when there should be about 120 or 121 to play here in the first half. Third down and six from the 11. Cornell trails 14 to nothing. Dassey with time. Lobs it to the end zone and it is incomplete. Intended for Barone in the end zone, and Bob Stokes broke it up. Credit Tony Capolino again. That young man is as good a quarterback 
pursuer as you could find in the Ivy League. Actually, Bob Stokes was the closer man to catching that ball. And for the third time this afternoon, Dan Quarles is going to try and put three points on the board for Cornell. He's missed from 42 and 32. This one is from 28. All have come from the left hash mark. That kick is good. Dave Quarles now one for three on the afternoon. A 28-yard field goal, and Cornell is on the board with 1.12 to play till halftime. It's Yale 14 and Cornell 3. your hat that's right he looked a little cold so more campus scenes here in New Haven Yale University where it was a might bit chilly yesterday it's <laughs> a bit warmer today certainly not tropical we were playing golf here in New England in 78 degree weather on Wednesday that temperature has been cut in half the latter stages of the week be interesting to see what Yale does here in the closing minute plus of this first half, Sean. If Carm Koza will be content to go into the locker room with that 11-point lead, knowing that he'll have the second half kickoff, or if he'll try and perhaps put some more points on the board before halftime with the way Kelly Ryan has been throwing the ball, I would certainly think about that. He has been most effective. He's had the one interception, his first interception in five weeks, and that came about only because it went off the hands of Dean Athanasia. Morals to kick off. The senior from Birmingham Hills, Michigan, drove it down to the seven-yard line. Kevin Price on the return. And he's up to the 21 before being tackled right there. Kelly Ryan has a minute and five seconds to play until halftime. 14-yard return by Kevin Bryce on the kickoff. Now there is enough time there, and with Cornell having the two timeouts, if Yale wants to just sit on the ball, they're going to have to get at least one first down to be able to ride out the time here in the first half. Cordell, as Jack speculated, is going to use its timeout. And they have one remaining. Cornell getting the field goal after marching down, having the ball picked off, and then starting anew because of the fumble recovery. So officially, it's a four-yard, four-play drive to come up with a field goal. Cornell has one timeout remaining, and unofficially with 58 seconds remaining in the first half. Yale, if they do not get a first down, would give the ball back to Cornell with at least a few ticks left, and I'm sure Carm Koza is aware of that, and Seb Laspina's play calling will be to try and get the seven or eight yards they need here to get a first down and know that they can go into the locker room running out the clock. 58 seconds showing on the scoreboard clock. We're not sure now if that is official or not. After the conversations along the sideline moments ago. Extra time did tick off the clock after Cornell had called the timeout. Second down and eight after the gain of two for Bryce on first down. Yale looks to throw here. Ryan has running room. And he goes out of bounds, saving a timeout for Cornell. Jeff Delamalor chased him out at the 28-yard line, about three and a half yards shy of a first down. The discretion there for... Kelly Ryan was, I don't want to get hit. And after you've had major surgery on your knee, I guess I don't blame you for wanting to run out of bounds instead. But he did stop the clock. And if the Bulldogs don't pick up four yards here, Cornell can stop the clock if the clock is not stopped by St. Incompletion and, and have about a half a minute left. And the wind at their backs. Bryce. Has the first down and much more. Price in the secondary. And 
out of bounds in Cornell territory as a flag comes down where Bryce went out at the 43 yard line. Not a smart play at the end by Bob Shoup. He's going to be called for either illegal use of hands or a clip. He ran into the he ran into the back right at the end. Watch this here as you see Kevin Bryce working to get out of bounds. Now watch coming from the right side of your screen, number 17, Bob Shoup, right there, knocking down Mike Rates. Mm, Bryce that, that's was just, already out of bounds. That, that's just not a smart play. You can already see your man out of bounds. This is a good, good effort by Kevin Bryce. Made a good move there to get away from Mike Farley. And now you can see he's out of bounds and Shoup comes up too late. And really takes away now a Yale scoring chance. Although with 43 seconds left and two timeouts remaining, they can now think about trying to get some more points. It's first down, Yale, from their own 40 instead of from the Cornell 43. Ryan going deep downfield for Zuba, and it's incomplete. Mark Perlman on the coverage, along with Corky Webb, who came over the tail end of the play. Perlman is still down at the Cornell 20 yard line. That ball was more than 40 yards in the air, and Zuba came very close to offensive interference as he was fighting to get that ball, with Mark Perlman having good position on him. Perlman stumbles here a little bit. They got bumped by Zuba, and then Corky Webb, his own man, hits him accidentally, as you see. Perlman does wear the eye shield across his face mask. Cornell is already without Brent Felito, their strong safety, who broke his wrist in the Colgate game. Watch it here. He got whacked in the head. It was the, and then he gets right here, the elbow right in the throat. It looks like the chest and throat area, like big time wrestling. I think the worst of it that he got was from Corky Webb, his own player, coming flying over. Well, it. but they are working up they're working up around his neck and shoulder area where Zuba came down on top of him, and that's apparently what the problem is, and that's why we have a stop and play with 36 seconds to go here in the first half. Yale came out of the huddle ready to line it up, but they are still attending to Mark Perlman. Perlman, a senior economics major from Arlington Heights, Illinois. Cornell came into the season feeling that their secondary was the deepest part of this football team and you see what we're going to have for you next week here on the Ivy League game of the week on PBS Penn at Harvard that should be a dandy but injuries have tested the depth of that Cornell secondary Harvard playing Holy Cross this afternoon so they will certainly have a share of the lead next week with either Cornell or Yale the winner of this football game. Yale is at Princeton next week and then home here in the bowl on the 21st, the final week of the season, to host Harvard in the game, which could well be the title game as well should Yale go on to win here today. If Yale goes on to become the Ivy champs, Sean, they will have justified their claim to the title with this nutcracker they're going through in the final three weeks. This strong Cornell team, of course, which is fighting for it, and then we also have that Princeton team, as you can see us amidst the uh, construction going on. We took a ladder up to the booth here today. <laughs> <laughs> but they have Princeton next week, and that's always a big rivalry. And then, of course, the rivalry with Harvard the final week, and Harvard has just the loss to Cornell on its ledger for the moment. Can you give me that hammer? They had banging that's a few right, more nails yeah. while we uh, have a moment. Be knocking off some mortar off of our uh, clothing for a while <laughs> after this one. Yes, Chris Carmody, our producer, will see the dry cleaning bills from, from this performance today here in the booth. Obviously, some sort of neck injury to Mark Perlman because they are taking a great deal of time. The good news is he has moved. He's moving his legs as we look down there now. As we look at scores from around the country.
More upsets in the making. The big one at South Bend with Boston College leading Notre Dame. You can see Perlman also is moving his arms there as well. So he does have movement, which is always a relief when we have these situations. They have not called for a stretcher, so it would appear that they expect Mark to be able to get up and walk off at some point in time. Take one more look and watch as Tom Zuba comes down here. First, the initial bump to the head. Then as Zuba comes down, I plus, think Corky Webb's knee hit him right in the head there as he went across. And then Zuba landed on his head as well. Mark Perlman is a black belt in judo, a seven-time ju judo national junior champion. They have taken his helmet off now. All of this comes with 36 seconds left in the first half and Yale leading 14 to 3. They began the scoring on their first drive of the day. A one yard touchdown run by Mike Stewart which capped off a 16 play 75 yard drive during which Yale converted three fourth down situations. They scored with 247 left after the end. And unfortunately now the stretcher is coming out to take Mark Perlman off the field. That came that first touchdown for Yale came after Cornell's Dave Quarles had missed a 42 yard field goal at the end of Cornell's first possession of the day. Yale made it 14 nothing in the second quarter with 442 left. Mike Stewart a two yard run. Having off a 12 play 80 yard drive during which Yale converted a fourth down and 11 situation in Cornell territory on a 15 yard pass to Dean Athanasia. Then Stewart the touchdown Derby the extra point. Yale led 14 to nothing. Cornell picked a field goal moments ago. Dave Quarles from 28 yards out after Richard Huff of Yale had intercepted a pass. During the run back, he fumbled after a hit by Steve Lutz. Doug Langan recovered at the 15 of Yale. Cornell could move down just to the 11 yard line before Quarles kicked that 28 yard field goal. That accounts for the score 14 to 3 with 36 seconds left in the first half. We talked at length earlier about what an important game this is, and certainly it is a very important game, but situations like these make you realize how unimportant the game can be when a player like Mark Perlman or any player is being assisted off the field with the stretcher. I've had a, a number of people ask me this, and I'm sure Mike Madden could echo the same thing when people see somebody get hurt and they say, well, when you played the game, didn't you worry about getting hurt? You really don't, and if you did, I don't think you could play effectively and probably would have a greater chance of, of getting yourself hurt if you played that way. You play the game and hope that all goes well, and certainly in Mark Perlman's situation, we hope this is not too serious, that it is a precautionary measure here. But you have to play the game that way. You can't afford to, to be tentative. You never want to speculate when it is a serious injury potential situation. But the good news, as we pointed out, is that Mark Perlman has moved his arms and legs at various times during his time on the field. Take a look at some statistics. Kelly Ryan, the Yale quarterback, is 10 of 16 right now for 138 yards passing. He's thrown one interception his first in five games. Cornell's Dave Dassey is 8 for 15 for 74 yards. He's also thrown an interception, which was handed right back to Cornell on the fumble by Huff on the interception return. Yale's Mike Stewart trying to achieve 100 yards for the fifth time this season has 35 yards right now on 12 carries, but he's also scored the two Yale touchdowns. The running game for Cornell has had trouble getting on track, but they haven't really attempted to rush the ball much, Jack. Scott Malaga, five carries for 14 yards. Todd Ryman, three carries, all of them on Cornell's first possession for 19 yards. Cornell ran the ball effectively on that first drive, but have not done that much running the football since then, and partly because Yale has got that 11 point advantage. At one point it was 14 to nothing. Yale has been, I think, most effective in terms of keeping drives alive. They have converted on fourth down 
on four consecutive times here. And that really is the difference in the ball game. When they've had to come up with the yardage, they've been able to do that. Cornell, when they have had to come up with yardage on third down, they have not there. One for six on third down. And then, of course, of the three field goal tries, they have made just one of three. Ambulance down in the tunnel on the far side by the Cornell locker room as they continue to make sure that everything is squared away before they move Mark Perlman on the gurney that they wheeled out. Well, let's hope things are not too serious for Mark Perlman and in all that precaution is just that precaution and that he'll be all right. Amen. Play set to resume now for Yale. They're at their 40 yard line faced with second and 10. 32 seconds to play second quarter. Yale leads 14 to three. Ryan over the middle intercepted and dropped and caught by DeLamalore. In and out of the hands of Mike Farley it went, and Jeff DeLamalore made the diving interception at the 44-yard line. Great play by the senior from Royal Oak, Michigan, at his fourth interception of the year. Mike Farley couldn't believe this ball was thrown right in his hands. And he started running before he had it. Somehow he kept the ball alive enough for Jeff DeLamalore to make a great play. And Cornell, perhaps with a last-second chance here in the first half. Kelly Ryan, I don't know where he was throwing that ball. 26 seconds for Cornell. They're 56 yards from the end zone. Dassey, deep down the middle and caught. Mike Perone made the reception at the 27-yard line. They'll stop the clock as they move the chains. And they'll stop it because Cornell has called for a timeout. Fine catch by Perone over the middle his first catch of the season. That is Cornell's final timeout. But they are now at least potentially in range of another field goal. There you see they uh, taken Mark Perlman away just a few moments ago. The Cornell defensive back that was injured. Jack, not that it's all at all important in the scope of things because Mark Perlman's personal situation is much more important than the result of this football game. But emotionally, what kind of an effect can that have on, on either team? Players on both sides are human beings, and they've got to be concerned and disheartened by seeing a player down the field for that length of time with potentially a serious injury. Well, I think you just think about Mark himself, and you hope that he's all right. I, again, you don't think about, well, that could have been me or that kind of thing. You just can't afford to. But does it take any of the emotion out of the football game? Is it tougher to stay revved up for this contest, as important as it is? I don't think so. 19 seconds to go. First down, Big Red. Dassey to the sideline. Incomplete. Wrigley appeared to be out of bounds even before he caught the football. He was definitely out when he caught it, but he appeared to step out previously up the sideline a bit. Not sure that catch would have counted even if he had caught it inbound. Well conceived play that time by Cornell. They took a page out of the Yale book. Dassey rolled to his left and then was throwing back right. Ball just sailed on him with the wind and Brickley couldn't catch it and stay in bounds. 
13 seconds to go. You'd have to think Cornell will throw for the sidelines or the end zone here. If they throw it in the field of play, they probably won't have time to get the field goal unit up. Dassey over the middle and incomplete. Intended for Mike Reddy, Steve Essek broke it up, number nine. What will Cornell do with eight seconds to go, faced with third down? Do they try one more play before attempting the field goal? Well, keep in mind that we don't know if it is eight seconds left or perhaps 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. We had that earlier timeout in which the clock kept running. The officials talked to both sidelines, so the coaches know. There's Bob Colbert, the receivers coach for Cornell. He is on the phones with Eddie Wilson, the offensive coordinator. As Maxie Bond looks on, they might feel that that's beyond Coral's range at this point. Dassey toward the end zone. Good coverage out there, and it's incomplete. Richard Huff broke it up. It was intended for Sean Hawkins. One second showing on the stadium clock. And time for a field goal attempt for Dave Quarles. The jump ball situation here. You put it into the end zone. You hope that the receiver can be the better athlete in the confrontation. But Huff just with good defensive position to break up that play. Quarles trying a field goal of 44 yards out of the hold of Aaron Samita. This would be his longest of the season. His previous long 42. He missed from 42 today. That kick is well wide. So a tough first half for Dave Quarles. He's one for four on field goal attempts. And the Cornell Big Red and the Yale Bulldogs head off at halftime. With Yale on top by 11, 14 to 3 is our score at the break. Let's go down now to Mike Matt. Mike? With me now is uh, Cornell's trainer, Bernie De Palma. Bernie, what's the situation with Mark Perlman? He got uh, hit in the head and he's got some spinal, uh, he's got some numbness down his arms and his legs and some tingling sensation. He's got some positive signs and it's just precaution. We're going to get him down to the hospital and get an x ray and then hopefully it'll come out negative. We'll get him back for the second half, uh, at least back up here, not to play, but at least back up here. I, don't, I think he'll be all right. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, Mike. That's very encouraging news from uh, Bernie De Palma, the trainer for the Big Red of Cornell. And as we speculated, with his movement in his arms and legs, the removal of him from the field on the stretcher was uh, precautionary, we hope. And we'll pass along the results of those tests if they come available before the end of the football game today. We'll be right back to the Yale Bowl after this word from your local public television station. Sean McDonough with Mike Madden and Jack Corrigan. We're back live at the Yale Bowl in New Haven, Connecticut, where our score at the half is Yale 14 and Cornell 3. Yale took the lead in the first quarter, an impressive 75-yard drive in 16 plays capped by a Mike Stewart one-yard touchdown run. During that drive, the Bulldogs converted three fourth-down situations. Dave Derby kicked the extra point after the touchdown run, and with 2.47 to play in the first quarter, Yale led 7-0. That was all of the scoring in the first quarter. Cornell did miss a 42-yard field goal after their opening drive. In the second quarter, it became 14-0 Yale with 4.42 to play till halftime. Mike Stewart, his second touchdown of the day, this one from two yards out. Another fourth down and conversion kept that drive alive for Yale, a fourth and 11 pass, went for 15 yards. Kelly Ryan to Dean Athanasia, 12 plays, 80 yards the drive, 14-0 Yale after Derby's extra point. Cornell scored just before the half, a minute and 12 to play. Dave Quarles. A 28-yard field goal. He was just one for four on field goals in the first half. That came after Rich Huff of Yale had intercepted a pass. But then he fumbled it after a hit by Steve Lutz of Cornell. Doug Langan recovered for the big red at the 15. They could move just to the 11 and set up the field goal by Quarles. 14-3, to three, our score at the half. And now a word from Cornell University, whose business school, the Johnson Graduate School of Management, is revitalizing its approach, taking full advantage of the vast resources of a major research university in order to prepare future business leaders for a highly competitive and knowledge-intensive international environment. We're back live at the Yale Bowl at halftime of this very important Ivy League contest between Yale and Cornell, and at the half, Yale has a 14-3 lead over the Big Red. I'm Sean McDonough, along with Jack Corrigan and Mike Madden. We hope you're enjoying today's game coast-to-coast -coast on PBS. Yale uh, ahead on the scoreboard. Cornell with the missed opportunities on the field goals and moving the ball successfully. They're a pass offense team anyway, Jack, so I wouldn't think that Cornell would have to do too much differently in the second half. When Usually when you're behind, you throw the ball. They throw the ball anyway. What, what we are seeing in the first half is something that has been plaguing Cornell the last several weeks, the inability to finish off what they've begun. We see the three missed field goals, but more importantly, 
the missed opportunities to come away with seven points. Yale has been inside Cornell territory several times and been much more effective in terms of coming up with points, converting on third and fourth downs. So I, in terms of play calling, I don't think you're going to see much different from either team. It's just a matter of uh, which team is going to continue to execute better. And for the moment, it's Yale. Seems like Yale has thrown the ball a bit more in this football game than we've seen them do in the past. And Mike Stewart's rushing numbers, 35 yards at the half, not up to par with what he's had in recent weeks. Has the loss of Troy Jenkins, their outstanding blocking fullback. Carm Koza says he's the best blocking fullback they've ever had. Is that loss noticeable, do you think, in their running game? I think that's a factor, certainly, in terms of what has been happening here. But I, I also think that Yale came into this ball game figuring they were going to have some problems running the ball because Cornell does such a good job of shutting down the run a little bit more than 120 yards a game. So Cornell probably was surprised initially by Yale's reliance on the pass and will be trying to make some adjustments on that. I think Yale will continue to try and find some kind of balance, but probably a little bit more of a 60-40, maybe 65-35 pass to run when they're usually the other way around. One of the stars of the league this year in the Ivy League has been Yale quarterback Kelly Ryan. Jack, I know you had a chance to speak with him yesterday. That's right. We talked with uh, Kelly Ryan yesterday, the senior captain of the Elias from Springfield, Illinois. Last year he was hurt. The Bulldogs were just 3-7. and seven. This year things are going much better. Needless to say, what a difference a year makes. This year's ball club has really come around. Uh, we've seen a lot of improvement from last year's team. I think the seniors are providing a good nucleus of leadership. And I think overall this team has a lot of poise and character. And, and that showed in the, in the close, close games that we, that we won. For Kelly Ryan in particular, this year has been a, a season of, of just overall consistent play. I mean, you, you've had some great moments, obviously, but your consistent play at the quarterback spot in terms of, of doing the things this offense demands, I think, is, is the most striking aspect of your season. I feel very confident going into this season. And, and as the years gone by, I, I think I've matured a little bit as a quarterback and as a leader. I have a lot of confidence in the, in the offensive players on our team. We have a good balanced attack. I think with Mike Stewart's running ability back in our offense, that's, that's a big plus for us. And then our receiving core has played spectacular. So I think we've got a good blend going, and uh, it's, it's gone well through the first seven games. When you talk about Yale football, the names of Frank Merriwell and Brian Dowling and all sorts of other last-second heroes come to mind. And, it's been a little bit of that again here in 87. You guys three times have won ball games right at the end. That's, that's something a little bit extra, isn't it? This team has a, a, a special feeling about it. I, I don't know exactly how to explain it, but we never feel we're out of a ball game. It doesn't matter how much time is left on the clock. As long as there's, there's something up there, we still have a chance. And, and that goes for all aspects of our team. It's offense, defense, the kicking game. We really have a good feeling about each other. Let's talk a little bit particular in, in terms of these last second wins about the pen game. I mean, there was pen with the ball. All I had to do was kill the clock and they fumble it. What was the emotional aspects? Uh, what was the emotional feelings uh, in that huddle offensively as you guys knew you had one more chance? In the pen game, that was just an unbelievable um, occurrence of events. The way it turned out, we got the ball back with 30 seconds to go. And we needed a good drive to get the ball down in the field goal range. Offensively, we went out there and with the purpose. We had no timeouts left, and we knew what we had to do. It was a great feeling. Everyone had a lot of confidence. There weren't a lot of words spoken, but everyone knew what, what it was coming down to. And as the last play was called, there was a certain feeling in the huddle that everything was going to work out. And Bob, she came up with a spectacular play, and uh, the miracle happened. What about for yourself in individually, Kelly? Uh, what are the aspirations for you beyond this season? Well, I'm trying not to look too much further than this season. Obviously, during the week, I, um, I think about next year. I think if I have an opportunity to continue to play football, I'll, I'll definitely take the chance. Um, to be a, a realist is to understand that there's a lot of other players across the country who are also in position where they might be playing this year. Um, if the opportunity comes, I'll love it, I'll enjoy it, and I'll take the shot. I guess the, the most important question in, in football players uh, are well schooled by their coaches not to think too far ahead but when you are a Yale football player having a good season and the Harvard football team is having a good season you can't help I gotta believe in the back of your mind think about that game down the road I, I do I try not to dwell on it but I could think of nothing better than to have the Yale Harvard game in the bowl 
as the last game for my senior class and have that be for the title. That's when I came here. That was that's a dream, and uh, the way th the events have really turned out, it's it's a possibility now. That would be uh, something special. That'd be something special indeed. I think of the uh, great games over the years that have decided titles and, and made legends. This year could be the same. I, I would like nothing better than to meet Harvard in front of a lot of people in the Yale Bowl. That would just be a great end to a, a great four-year experience at Yale for me. He's Yale quarterback Kelly Ryan, and he's led his team to a 14-3 lead over Cornell at the half. Let's take a look now at other scores after we check out the halftime stats. We'll take a look around the Ivy League and the rest of the nation as the season heads toward its conclusion. Hard to believe. And the first half numbers really pretty even. Cornell's missed field goal opportunities resulting in the more lopsided score of 14 to 3 than those stats would indicate. Well, just as we talked a few minutes ago, Sean, that's really been the difference in the ball game as it's been over the last month for Cornell. They have really struggled to score points ever since that Harvard game. Time of possession virtually even. Cornell with long sustained drives right from the beginning. Their very first drive of the day after the opening kickoff moved from their 22 down to the yield 25. That was the first of the three missed field goals by Dave Quarles. Now scores from around the nation and Indiana trying to climb back into that game after falling behind 16 to nothing. Holy Cross leading at halftime. Harvard putting up a good battle against the number one team in one double A. Brown likewise against Lehigh and other Action involving Ivy teams. Colgate taking the measure of Princeton down in New Jersey. And Penn also leading in a non-conference game. We have not rival. seen Penn since week one of the season. You have to wonder what went wrong there this year. They certainly have more talent, although Chris Flynn has been injured, and I know that was a part of it, but they have more talent than their record would indicate. Columbia still hanging on, trying to end that long losing skid as they lead Dartmouth by a point. They were leading 7-2 to at one time. Georgia leading in the battle in the SEC. Service Academy fight on Colorado Springs this year, I guess. Or would that be on the Hudson? I've got to believe with a ball game underway, it's on the Hudson. And our score here at halftime is Yale 14 and Cornell 3. Professor Roman Coots has been on the Yale campus since 1979. His work in electrical engineering has been diverse. But through a grant of the National Science Foundation and the Veterans Administration, Professor Coots and his students have been developing tools to aid the handicapped. These tools could perhaps help the quality of life for those impaired. Back live at the half at the Yale Bowl where the score is Yale 14 and Cornell 3. Let's go down to the sidelines now where Mike Madden is standing by with Cornell coach Maxie Bond. Mike? Yeah, Coach, you're down 14 to 3 at halftime. What can we expect to see in the second half coming up? What we got to do, Mike, is we got to finish off some things that we're getting started, uh, especially on offense. We uh, have been able to move the ball. We just got to finish off a couple of those drives, and uh, we're not too upset at the, the way things are going. We just got to get some points on the board. They've been able to move the ball, and that's uh, credit to them, but I think we can stop them. Okay, well, good luck, and uh, thank you. All right. Thank you, Mike Madden, and thanks to Maxie Bond as well. And that's just as we stated at the beginning of halftime, Jack. Cornell has moved the ball. They really don't have to do much differently except finish it off when you get down around the 15-yard line, punch it the rest of the way in. Well, we saw even in uh, our last Cornell telecast when they played Harvard and had that dramatic victory, a lot of the drama was provided because Cornell was stopped when they had a chance to take the lead the first time when they were stopped at the goal line by Harvard. Ultimately, the safety and the long touchdown reception gave them the victory but they've had problems scoring down deep in the opposition's territory for Carm Koza and the Yale Bulldogs they just want to keep doing what they did in the first half and cut down on the turnovers it's surprising for Yale that they've had some problems with turnovers today the first time that has really affected them since uh, well way back to the Hawaii mm -hmm. game Yale will get the ball first here in the second half Dave Quarles set to kick off. Kevin Bryce at the top of your screen. Reggie Sellers, number 25 on the bottom. Back deep to receive the kickoff for Yale. Corals kicks with the wind. A short kick, which comes down to Bryce, and he drops it at the 11. Bryce in serious trouble. Now breaks away from the pack and crosses the 20. Don't know how he escaped, but he did. Kevin Bryce went out of bounds at the 22 and a half yard line. There was that massive humanity, and how about that score? Notre Dame has come back 
And they are now tied with Boston College. It was that big pile of bodies, and all of a sudden Kevin Bryce popped out and got something positive out of it. Kelly Ryan intercepted twice in the first half, and he had not had an interception since the Hawaii game more than a month ago. He has only five interceptions on the year. First play from scrimmage of the second half. Mike Stewart takes the handoff and gets just back to the line of scrimmage. Good pursuit on the play by the Cornell defense. Mike Rach came up from his corner spot to be in on the tackle. Jeff DeLamalore also there and Chris Finn, number 47. Reaction from the crowd here as they announce that Columbia Dartmouth score we gave you a little while ago. Columbia leading Dartmouth at halftime, 10 to 9. Second and 10, Yale. Down to three seconds left on the 25 second clock. One second as they snap it. Stewart, again, no running room at all. He was wrapped up by Rick Calhoun, number 97, the senior from Penlin, Pennsylvania. One of the drawbacks of I-formation football is that your tailback lines up a good seven or eight yards behind the line of scrimmage. And if you don't move the defense off the ball, he's got all he can do just to get back to the line of scrimmage. Stewart got about one, perhaps one and a half, and it's third down and a long eight. Will throw Mitchell Lee pressures him and it's caught by Bob Shoup. It'll depend on where they spot him for a first down. Needed to get near the 33 and he appears to have it where they're going to mark his forward progress. Mitchell Lee on a delayed stunt got in the face of Kelly Ryan, but he was able to get the throw off with enough on it to get it to shoot for the catch. And he got himself up far enough to come up with the first down. Mitchell Lee, the sophomore from Rochester, New York, got there, but didn't prevent Kelly Ryan from getting it off. And what a great athletic play by Ryan to throw that ball as he was leaning left. Mike Stewart, the first down carry, and he got across the 35 and up to about the 37. Mike McGran, number 56, junior outside linebacker from Houston, Texas, came up and made the play. He's an economics and psychology dual major at Cornell. Call it a gain of three, second and seven for Yale. We've played two and a half minutes here in the third quarter. Yale 14, Cornell three. Bryce up the middle, across the 40 and down at the 41 yard line. Kevin Bryce, the carrier for Yale. What Yale wants to do here is grind it down and put seven up on the board and really put the big red up against it. What Cornell is trying to do is get the ball back quickly and take some advantage of the field position with the wind at their back, but the first down the last time by Yale took a lot of that away. I'm amazed that Yale has been able to continue to avoid the problems of their less than good kicking game. And as you can see by those fans, it's getting a bit chilly as the sun goes down in the late afternoon here in New Haven. Mike Stewart appears to be short of a first down as he goes down just beyond the 42-yard line. Needed to make it to the 43 for the first down. And Yale appears to be faced with a punting situation, and they will. The punting team started on the field, and then Carm Cosa said, wait a minute, let's take a look at this, then decided we had better punt. And Todd Cowan is out for the second time this afternoon. Cowan just about 28 yards of punt on the year. And his lone punt of the first half was only 24 yards. Kicking into the wind, Mike Rach back for Cornell, standing at his own 27. That's a better kick. Rach at the 28. And the return nets about three yards to the 31. That's where Cornell comes on offense for the first time in the second half. 11.02 to play third quarter, Yale 14, Cornell 3. The 
<laughs> I noticed they deleted the word famous from the uh, <laughs> list of graduates. Congratulations, you've earned some distinguished company there. Up the middle goes Marvin Dunklin on the first play of the second half of Cornell. He picked up about four out to the 35-yard line. Maxie Ball, a graduate of Georgia Tech, was an All-American there, an All-Pro nine times in 13 seasons in the National Football League. Second down six, Dave Dassey. He's gone all the way for Cornell. He throws it. Reese with the interception for Yale. They're back in business inside the 35-yard line of Cornell. Second interception of the year for the sophomore from West Babylon, New York. It appeared that Glover Lawrence, number 73, tipped the ball at the line of scrimmage. Watch it again. Now it's not Lawrence. It is number 56 Mike for Brown. Yale. Mike Brown, who had the deflection. And John Reese, the sophomore, with the big play. First and 10, Yale with the Cornell 35. Kelly Ryan to throw. In the flat, complete. Tom Zuma has a first down as he goes out of bounds at the 24-yard line. Gain of 11 for Ryan and Zuma. Ryan drills this ball. Jeff Delamalor going for the interception. Couldn't get it. Zuba has himself another catch. Fourth quarter, five five day. Day. Yes, indeed. He is 37 for the season. 14 shy now of Yale's single season record of 51 catches by Kurt Grieve in 1981. From the 24, first and 10. 10 21 to play third quarter. Yale leads by 11, trying to build on it. Ryan trying to build on it right here. Incomplete. Rich Schulte, the intended receiver. Mike Rach on the coverage. Going for the jugular. The Bulldogs with Cornell back on its heels, trying to finish him off. So you better throw the ball perfect to beat Mike Rates, the all Ivy cornerback. Schulte nearly came up with a very nice catch in the end zone. Shadows beginning to move onto the field as the sun sets behind the Yale Bowl. We'll see if that becomes a factor for the receivers in the late stages of the football game. On the delay, Stewart running off right tackle and getting ahead for about four. Mike Stewart, the carrier. Down to the 21-yard line. Call it a gain of three for McGrath. Stewart. Mike McGran again in on the tackle. Came in as the fifth leading tackler for Cordell. Third and seven. Third and seven upcoming. We talked about Yale's success on third and fourth downs in the first half being a real key. They were in a similar situation right here. Down at the Cornell 21. Cornell shows the blitz. They come. It's picked off. Ryan throws complete. Heavy hit by Donnell Johnson. And he might have prevented the first down for Bob Shoup as he drove him out just shy of the marker. Inside the 15 at the 14 and a half. They needed to get to the 14 yard line. They're a half, li a half yard short, and Karm Koza doesn't even have to consider it. They're going for it as they have all day long. They bring in Chris Plunkett, their second tight end. Take Shoop out of the ball game. The question is do you go with the sneak here, or do you power with Stewart? Fourth and less than a yard. Stewart. Didn't get there, it wouldn't appear from here. Zanel Johnson came up, Mitch Leon on the tackle, Dave Pohl and all leading the surge for Cornell, and they have stopped Yale short. I was a little surprised there, Sean. They went wide. They've been successful running wide, but on fourth down, I think you take the shortest possible distance straight ahead. They try and go wide with Stewart, Johnson and Lee. A couple of good hits. Dave Poland came in to make sure that Stewart didn't lunge forward for the first down yardage. So Cornell, at least for the moment, dodges the bullet after the interception. Dave Dassey calling the signals on first and 10 for Cornell. 9.27 to play third quarter. Scott Malaga breaks through, picks up nine on first down as he came up just shy of the 25-yard line. That's what Cornell needs to do more often. 
get positive yardage on first down. I think they put too much pressure on Dave Dassey when they're in second and long, third and medium to long situations. They can get out and get seven, eight, nine yards like they have here on first down. It's a lot easier for the young quarterback. Dave Dassey doubles as the starting shortstop on the Cornell baseball team. He hit 307 last season. On second and one, Dassey going deep down the sideline into the sun and incomplete. Chris Rutan on the coverage of Sean Hawkins. That's a complete intended for Sean Hawkins. Chris Rutan playing for the injured Dave Sullivan and playing well today. Good coverage, as you can see right there, as they're both looking into the sun, but that's just blanket coverage there by Rutan. Chris Rutan's dad ran track at Stetson University and played for the Baltimore Colts back in 1951. Chris's brother Greg is on the Yale rugby team. Third down and one, Dassey up with the keeper and with the first down pickup. He moved out to the 27-yard line. Ivy League men's soccer today, Columbia four, Dartmouth one, and Yale shut out Cornell just outside the Yale Bowl earlier this morning by a score of one to nothing. Clock down to less than eight and a half remaining here in the third period, 825 and counting. You can see the statistical battle just about even. The difference, Cornell's failure to come up with points when they've had the chance. First and 10 from the 27, Mike ready in motion. Passing from the sideline, incomplete intended for Reddy, who took a solid hit from Bob Stokes as that pass fell incomplete. That's incomplete intended for Mike Reddy. You see the Cornell flag on the far Stokes side showing you the breeze that is at the Cornell. back of the big red offense here in the third period. But as we told you right at the start of the ball game, because of the the bowl configuration here, you get a real swirling effect many times down at field level. Second and 10. Tim McDevitt, number 34, has the first down as he made his way out to the 40-yard line. Pickup of 12 on the play. McDevitt hasn't seen much action lately after starting the season as the starting halfback. There was a big blitz that time. Both linebackers and Steve Essek, the monster, were all firing in, and Cornell caught Yale off guard with the draw play, the delay. And McDevitt, who also plays in the attack group for the Cornell lacrosse team, gets the first down. At the 40-yard line, first and 10. 7.45 to play, third quarter. Yale 14, Cornell 3. Dassey. Intercepted. He threw it right into the arms of Jim D'Onofrio. His first interception of the year. He's a defensive tackle. A junior from North Merrick, New York. And Yale right back on offense after the second interception of Dave Dassey here in the third quarter. It was a screen to Malaga. Malaga fell down. Dassey threw it without looking. You see Malaga on the ground. And Cornell had three interceptions last week, three here this afternoon. I don't care how good your defense is, you just can't keep putting them in trouble like that. That's for sure. You can't keep giving Kelly Ryan the ball at the 35-yard line, as they've done twice in a row. Stewart throws wide open Zuba. And he has the first down at the 18-yard line. Penalty flag back at the 28-yard line. It was thrown in the secondary. We may have an ineligible receiver downfield. Flag on the play. Jack, you've been right on the money with these calls today. That's what it was. Either they lined up improperly and had it, a guy going downfield who shouldn't have been allowed to go downfield, or it was actually one of the interior linemen. Colgate and Kenny Gamble on the way to another victory. Penn hanging in there against Lafayette. We'll have Penn next week, and Notre Dame has now taken the lead on Boston College. How about that one? Indiana was down 16 to nothing in that football game with their Rose Bowl hopes swinging in the balance. Five-yard walk-off against the Bulldogs. They're back at the 39-yard line and faced with first down and 15. You see the time remaining, 7.20 and the clock running in the third quarter.
Stewart lost a yard. Stewart, Stewart Cross and Gary Rinkus made the tackle. Rinkus, the senior co-captain from Hanover, Massachusetts. First team all Ivy last year when he had nine sacks. Business management major at Cornell. Cornell has basically shut down the Yale running game now. and You can see even more why Yale is dependent upon the strong right arm of Kelly Ryan. Ryan. Flags down. Looks like holding. Deep for Stewart. And it's incomplete. He appeared to have it momentarily but couldn't hang on. And flags down back at the line of scrimmage. Usually in the area you would expect holding against the offense, and it is. When they put Stewart into the slot like that, more often than not, he's heading straight down the field. See if we can pick up the infraction. It appears to be right there, the center, Kenny Tulo, who grabbed a hold of Mitchell Lee and dragged him down for the holding call. And Cornell is going to take the penalty because they want to keep backing up Yale, which I'm a little surprised mm. about. And now, Maxi Bond out on the field. Perhaps they didn't want to take it. Hearing some yelling from along the Yale sideline. Still second down, about 26 yards to go now for a Yale first down. Tokish comes on the blitz. The pass was thrown incomplete to Mike Stewart. Pressure applied by Tokish, the junior linebacker from Seattle, Washington, a biomedical engineering major at Cornell. That's what you studied, wasn't it? Uh, I don't think so. Jack Yale has demonstrated the ability to be a come from behind team this season, but can Cornell do it? We saw them do it against Harvard, but with some of their key weapons on offense injured, particularly Chris Hahn, we'll see if they can become a come from behind team. Yale has done it time and time again. Ryan throws incomplete, intended for shoot. Crowd groans as they thought the coverage from Mike Rach was a bit too tight. Not to mention the dissatisfaction of Bob Shoup right there. Shoup and Rach. Oh, and he's got some justification mm -hmm. for being upset. He also grabbed him by the face mask as he went up over the top. As we can hear, the Yale coaches along the near sideline quite vocal in their displeasure with the officials. Cornell's got 10 men up, but now they're dropping off. They're going to let Cowan punt it. That's the best effort of the day for Cowan. It drives Rach back to the 15, and he's going to go down and get back up. We had him down prematurely because he appeared to be going down, but Mike Rach has shown his elusive skills throughout the season. There's a penalty flag down on the play at the 40-yard line. That's usually holding on the receiving team as the ball is in the air, and Mike Rach has still not gotten up for Cornell. That's exactly what it is. I would guess that Yale will decline this because I don't think they'd get much better position than that. Mike Rach, Rach elude the uh, tacklers as he appeared to be going down right there, but no. And had he been able to get by the tackle of Rich Huff. Well, he has made big hits all day. He had a wall of blockers there. He just needed to get by Huff. It was a 35-yard punt, indeed the best effort of the afternoon for Todd Cowan. Ended up being a negative two-yard return, although Rach almost made something happen. And some Dan. The 13th. Lay down. Lay down. And Mike Rach, they've already lost Mark Perlman. We almost lost our cameraman. Neck. And Rach hobbling on his right ankle and must have twisted an ankle or a knee there. They cannot afford to lose him. Mark Perlman already out of the secondary today. Brent Polito lost for the season with a broken wrist. Mike Rach, their all Ivy performer, hobbling off the field. Appears to be okay, though, as he goes off. 
Okay. Peter Noyes talking to his defensive group, trying to get something going. Dave Kelly, the defensive coordinator for Yale, has got to be proud of the job done by his group here this afternoon. They've come up with three interceptions and thwarted Cornell when it counts. Cornell begins at its own eight-yard line, trailing 14 to three, six minutes to play third quarter. Up the middle they go on first down for about two yards out to the 10. Tim McDevitt on the carry. He's a junior from Levittown, New York. Business management major at Cornell. Next week in the Ivy League, Columbia at Cornell. Brown at Dartmouth. Penn at Harvard, the game will bring you on the Ivy League network. And Yale at Princeton, a very important game with Ivy title implications there. Yale hopes to go in with one loss in the league and tied with Harvard for the league lead. McDevitt again, again for about four more out to the 14. Set up a third down and four. And Cornell, which is converted on third down only twice this afternoon, four for Cornell. is the most important third down play right here. Two for eight officially on third down. While Yale is four for 12 on third, but four for four on fourth down. Third down, nearly five yards to go for a first down. Hawkins takes the pitch. Has some blocking. And has the first down as he goes out of bounds beyond the 19-yard line. Good effort by Sean Hawkins. He read his blocking well and picked up the first down. Let's go to Mike Madden right here. Spoke with Mike Rage. He said it's an injury that happened a couple weeks ago. He hurt his ankle just re-injured it he's trying to walk it off right now he thinks he's, he says he's going to try and go back he's not sure right now though all right michael thank you very much first down cornell at the big red 20 442 to play third quarter yale leads 14 to 3 all the scoring in the first half scott malaga pulls his way forward. finally taken down by john reese number 32 Last week at Dartmouth, John Reese was in on 13 John tackles. Reese made the stop for the Eli's. He was the Ivy sophomore of the week the in the game against the Penn, in which he registered 17 tackles. There's Mike Rach on the Cornell side trying to walk off that ankle sprain to his right ankle. He can be back, I'm sure he will be. Mike Rach, the nephew of New York Jets head football coach, Joe Walton. Dunklin across the 25 and he slides ahead to the 27 yard line about three yards shy of a first down Steve Essick was able to slow him down force Dunklin to stumble and then fall it's the one problem for Marvin he's just not big enough to be able to handle the contact that well I'll tell you what for an all sophomore secondary that's a heck of a recruiting group they have gotten with those four young men because they have made some big tackles come up with a couple of interceptions Done a fine job. Another big third down for Cornell. Third and three from the 27. With 3.25 to play in the third quarter. And Yale leading by 11. As he throws. Dropped by Sam Brickley. Might not have been good enough for a first down anyway. After he caught the ball, he would have had to turn and pick up about three yards. And he had the looming presence of John Reese bearing down on him as he tried to catch that ball. Bob Shoup back to receive for Yale. Coben on to punt. Shoup back to receive for Yale. He's standing at his own 41-yard line. Nine men up on the line of scrimmage for the Eli. Spiraling kick into the sun. Shoup makes the fair catch at the 40-yard line. So again, great field position for Yale. They've been unable to capitalize on good field position here in the third quarter, and the score remains as it was at halftime. Yale 14, Cornell 3. Big, big battle there in the top 10. And the Holy Cross now out to a three-touchdown lead on Harvard. The world's biggest cocktail party in Jacksonville, Georgia, Florida game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 Bryce 
Rice on first and ten. Ahead for about two, Mitchell Lee made the tackle. Evan Rice carried for the Eli. Have to give a lot of credit to that Cornell defense here in the second half, headed up by that guy, sophomore Mitchell Lee, who turned down a full scholarship to Syracuse, the unbeaten Orangemen, to come to Cornell. They've been hampered with tough field position here in the second half, but they've been able to shut down the Bulldogs. Unfortunately, their offense has not been able to chip into that 11-point deficit. Upton and Bryce now the backfield as Stewart is getting a rest for Yale. Ryan throws, and it's caught by Shoup in Cornell territory inside the 40. Dragged out of bounds by Corky Webb at the 35-yard line. 8 of 23 on the play, first and 10 Yale. You get a feeling, quarterback and receiver, when you've been together for four years like Kelly Ryan and Bob Shoup have been, you learn to just know where the guy is and know what he can do. And Shoup just sort of worked his way back against the grain of the Cornell zone defense, and Kelly Ryan found him. You heard Kelly at halftime talk about Shoup making the great play to win the ball game against Penn. From the 36, first and 10. Ryan throws. Tough day at the office for Yale's all time leading receiver, Dean Athanasia. That's his third drop today. Well, even the great ones don't have it as much as they'd like it. And sometimes that happens as it is for Dean today. Watched Art Monk a couple of weeks ago really struggle in a ball game for the Redskins. And you don't find many receivers better than Art Monk, and you have not found a better man in terms of catching the football total-wise than Dean Athanasia here at Yale in the history of this fine football program. Rice makes a tackle and gets ahead for about six yards down to the 30-yard line. Stuart Tross finally made the tackle. Marlowe and Tross may stop for the Big Red. Brings up a third down and four, and probably four down territory again for the Eli's of Yale. Because of the good field position, Yale has not been forced to punt too often. They can get away with having a less than great punting game. Ryan, quick hitter. That one's caught by Athanasia, and he has the first down at the 23 yard line. That's a checkoff, it's an inaction checkoff. Dean Athanasia, the tight end, is the hot receiver. He spots Mike McGran, the outside linebacker blitzing by him. He turns and immediately looks for the ball. Kelly Ryan delivers it for another first down. Dean Athanasia, a senior from Wilmington, Massachusetts, graduated ninth in his graduating class from Wilmington High School in suburban Boston. First and ten, Yale trying to build on a 14 to three lead. Ryan lofts it. Zoom is open and he has it at the three yard line. Taking advantage of Mike Rates being less than 100%, they ran a little out and go route. If Ryan had thrown this ball a little deeper, he might have the touchdown, the pump fake there, and then he fires it up deep, this ball hung up, otherwise Zuba would add himself a touchdown. Rach and Corky Webb combined on the tackle, but not before Zuba puts Yale inside the three. He's had a big day. 77 yards in receptions. Less than a minute to play, third quarter. Bryce stopped short of the goal line. Mitchell Lee, again, in on the tackle, just a sophomore, and the Cornell people have told us that they expect by the time he's a senior, He'll be one of the all-time greats to play linebacker at Cornell. They've had some good ones. The guy I played with at Cornell, Bob Lally, played pro football for several years, and they feel that Mitchell is the best middle linebacker the school has had since Lally played for the team in the early 70s. Nearing the end of period three, a scoreless third quarter, but Yale looking to draw blood. Bryce again, running right this time, and Short. He bounced in again. For the, Eli. the second time it looked like the Bulldogs might have had a score, but just a little bit shy of that last chalk line that counts. 
And that is the final play of the third quarter. So they will have to walk all the way down to the other end of the Yale Bowl. And Yale will be faced with a third and goal from inside the one. 14 to 3, Yale. That's our score at the end of the third quarter. And we'll be back at the Yale Bowl in just a moment. The Ivy League football game of the week is made possible. And as always, we want to add our thanks to Chrysler Plymouth and Payne Weber for their continuing support of Ivy League football on public television. A couple of Zanies without their shirts on, not the cheerleaders, obviously. A couple? It's a, that's, it's a few more than a couple. Just down below us, to our right as we look down on it, the uh, student section has gone topless. It's about 40 degrees, maybe a little bit colder with the wind chill factor here today. There's the distance that Yale has to travel to make it a 20 to 3 ball game. They'll have two cracks at it. Stewart going for his third touchdown, and he has it. Mike Stewart from a half yard out gives Yale a 20 to 3 lead with the extra point upcoming. We have got an injured Yale player. I believe it is Stewart. He ended up doing a total somersault and got popped pretty good as he was going over the, the pile and into the end zone. Watch the end of this play. Stewart really gets elevated on this score and whacked pretty good right there by Donnell Johnson as he finished his dive over the top. And now he's up and coming off under his own power. Mike Stewart, what a difference he has made for this Yale team with the speed and power out of that tailback position. Third score of the afternoon with a junior from Manchester, New Hampshire. On the way, perhaps, to a 1,000-yard season. He came into the ball game today with 776 yards. Derby to add the extra point. It's good right down the middle. Derby's a perfect three for three today. 49 yards now on the day for Stewart. So with Princeton and Harvard yet to face him and most of this fourth quarter remaining, he's still got a real good shot at a thousand yard year. And there have not been too many here at Cornell or at, at Yale, excuse me, who have gone for a thousand yards in the season. Rich Diana, Dick Geron. John Pagliaro, John did Pagliaro did it twice. Rich Diana also rushed for 1,000 yards in a season twice in his career. Dick Geron did it once. They are the only three Mike Stewart could join that illustrious group this season. More importantly, his team leads 21 to 3, 14.58 to play. Stewart also now needs just four yards to pass Calvin Hill and become number 10 all time on the Yale rushing list. As you see, Mike there, number 18. He still has all of next season left in addition to the remaining two games this year to add to that total. He'll move well past Calvin Hill and up the list. The Yale scoring drive. First of the second half. They've had good opportunities thanks to Cornell interceptions. Now what do you do if you're the big red? Do you almost have to throw on every down? Just about. I mean, they need three scores, so... You're into a real time bind now. Unless you can get yourself a kickoff return for a score. That's really what Cornell could use. Jonathan Gastel to kick off. Spinning line drive taken by Sam Brickley at the 7. He's out to the 25. Bounces away from the pile. Moves ahead for about six more out to the 31. Kick return by Brickley. Now the fourth quarter in yes. New York City. And it's still 10 to 9. Columbia leading Dartmouth. Trying to end the losing streak. And Notre Dame somehow came back and beat Boston College after being behind most of the ball game. Lou Holtz understanding that Golden Dome magic, I guess. A concerned Maxie Bowen. He knows it's been a tough day for his offense. Been a tough month, really, for his offense. 
It's been Dave Dassey all the way at quarterback. His pass complete to Sam Brickley. Breaks the tackle. And he's out to the 45-yard line. Good for a big red first down. Chris Rutan made the tackle with help from John Reese. You can see the opposition has had success scoring on Yale in the fourth quarter. Some of those points, though, because Hawaii just sort of added it up mm -hmm. at the end of that game. Dassey, all kinds of time, throws, and it's incomplete. Off the chest of Sean Hawkins appeared to be a catchable ball, although Richard Huff was tight on the coverage for Yale. Dassey took a real deep drop. He throws this into coverage, but he drilled it to Hawkins. Kind of ball you've got to catch when you're trying to get back into a football game. That should have been caught. Second and 10, Cornell from its own 45. Second and ten. Dassey down the sidelines for Reddy. He and Essek went out of bounds, and it's incomplete. Oh, and the coaching staff livid. You can see Maxie Bond right in the face of the officials along the far sideline. It was a jump ball between Reddy and Essek, and the officials rule incomplete. Well, the rule is if both players have possession of the ball, it goes to the offensive player. The judgment of the official on that sideline was that neither player really had possession as they went out of bounds. And they're right. As usual, they're still grasping for it there. They're out of bounds there. Third and 10. 14 10 to play, fourth quarter. Yale leads 21 to 3. Dassey has all day, completes it to Brickley, and he dives forward for the first down. And also as important for Cornell, he got out of bounds to stop the clock. They have to start thinking about that. Trailing by 18 with 14 minutes to play. Yale has gone into a very passive defense, which I'm a little bit surprised about, even leading by the 18 points as they are right now. They've gone to the four-man rush and have seven men in just zone coverage. I thought they were doing a better job when they were putting a little more pressure mm -hmm. on Dassey. Cornell has won the last two meetings between these two schools and four of the last five. Dassey again with time. Over the middle. Caught by Brickley. Inside the 25 and down at the 22. Don Lund made the tackle, but not after a gain of 22 yards on the play. Well, this is the area where Cornell has struggled. Fourth time, fifth time they've been inside the Yale 30 and have just three points to show for it. Lock running, 13.45 to play, fourth quarter. Yale 21, Cornell 3. One setback. That was Malaga behind Dassey. Brickley dropped the ball, tried to run before he caught it. Heard the footsteps of Chris Rutan coming on. Brickley spotted Steve Essick rolled up blitzing, pointed to Dassey that the blitz was coming. Both of them saw it. Sam just forgot to do one thing, catch the ball first. You saw he now has 45 catches for the season. That's the fourth best single season total in Cornell history. Two more, and he'll tie Bruce Starks of the class of 1974 with 47 catches. Second and 10. Dassey under pressure, throws incomplete. Ready the nearest man to it. Robert Stokes on the coverage for Yale, the sophomore from Riverdale, New Jersey. And One of the sophomores in that secondary of whom we spoke off in this afternoon. Excuse me. And now Yale has gone back to putting pressure on. They have blitzed here on the first two downs. Cornell should have succeeded on the first one, but Brickley dropped the ball. That time Lund had good pressure and had a hold of Dassey as he was trying to get rid of the pass. Cornell is four for 11 on third down. This is a very important third down and 10. over the middle caught by Reddy first down Cornell at the 10-yard line Steve Essek made the tackle 
an all-out blitz in just a four-deep zone and ready, running the slant pattern right in the middle of the zone. Dassey was getting all kinds of heat, but he put it on the money for a clutch catch and throw. Watch catch by Reddy, who started the season way down the depth chart with all the quality at the wide receiver spots for Cornell. Boy, Dassey got popped by Lund and Capolino just as he released the ball. To the ground they go. Football! It's three on the field. Yale thinks they have the ball. was going for big yardage, got popped, the ball came loose, and John Hansberry came up, Tim McDevitt, excuse me. McDevitt got popped by Chris, Chris Rutan. Rutan, and Lee Rehrman was beaten to the ball by John Hansberry. Yale with their fourth turnover that they've forced defensively, and a big one. Yale leads 21 to 3. 12.57 to play, fourth quarter. They start in a shadow of their own end zone. Ryan lost the ball. And Yale has it back right along the goal line. Over recovered by Yale. Ryan got his feet tangled up as he came away from center. Dave Pollan of Cornell didn't even realize he had the ball. He got hit by one of the pulling linemen. And Jeff Rudolph was the guy who bumped into Kelly Ryan, and that almost was a very costly error for Yale. You see the ball is still loose, but Ryan found it. Ryan's going to throw out of his own end zone. Slips and falls and throws incomplete. Nearly went down for a safety. That's incomplete and then to grab an agent. Interesting play call out of the shadow of their own end zone. From the one. Keep in mind that in the end zones, because it's the least amount of time spent in those areas, tend to be the softest parts of the field this time of year. We saw in the first half a Cornell receiver with a chance to break on the ball, Steve Lutz, and maybe come up with a touchdown catch, slip and fall. Here in the other end zone, Kelly Ryan right there nearly slipped into a safety. 12-12 to play, fourth quarter. It's third down and 13 from the one. Yale leads 21 to three. The delay to Price. And he stopped shy of the five yard line. Got to about the three. Dave Poland in on the tackle with help from Mike Farley for Cornell. And the Cornell defense does the job facing, forcing Yale to come right back and punt. Price took a pretty good pop. You can see he is favoring his left side as he heads to the sidelines and now that punt, for the Eli's. punt group of Yale put to the test here. Todd Cowan averages less than 30 yards per kick on the season. Cornell should get it in great field position, but they're running out of time. This a good kick. Rach calls for a fair catch and makes it at the 40-yard line. 37-yard punt, no return. Todd Cowan responding to the pressure. Georgia continuing to lead that battle, and Indiana trying to hang on to their Rose Bowl hopes continues to lead. My partner's alma mater cruising against the midshipmen. I have my Sugar Bowl reservations all made, Jack. <laughs> See you in New Orleans. Passing. Rose intercepted. Richard Huff, his second of the day. That young man has really been impressive today. The difference in this football game, Yale knows how to hang out of the football. Rolled and threw backside. Looked like it was going to be a big play, but Huff, terrific anticipation. If he doesn't make that play, Brickley's got a touchdown. He's a sophomore from Vincennes, Indiana. Richard Huff, his second interception of the day, his second of his career. Feels better about that one because on his first, he fumbled the ball while trying to return it. He's also had some big tackles today. From the 24, Rice hurdles a couple of tacklers and gets ahead for about four yards to the 30. 
While we have a moment, we would like to thank Mr. Ben O.C. Schmidt, Jr., the president of Yale University, Donald Kagan, the director of athletics, and Mark Curran, sports information director, for all their efforts in making this broadcast possible. We would also like to thank Mr. Frank H.T. Rhodes, the president of Cornell University, Lang Kennedy, the director of athletics, Dave Wohlhuter, sports information director, for all of their generous assistance. On second and four, Upton gets the call, gets ahead for about four. He's very close to a first down. Len Tokish made the tackle. Five turnovers today by the Cornell offense and three missed field goals as well. Several of those turnovers, three of them as a matter of fact, have come down deep in Yale territory. You can see statistically just about even, except in the one most important category up on the scoreboard. 21 to 3 Yale with 10-10 to play. Yale has led throughout. Kelly Ryan throws late. Out to the 47-yard line. Dean Athanasia made the catch for Yale. Number 102 of his career. A little bit of a surprising play call there on third and one to throw the football. But I guess when you've got a Kelly Ryan at quarterback and a Dean Athanasia at tight end, that's not really such a high-risk play call. Yeah! First and ten at the 48. Right, Time the ally of the Eli's. It's 9.38 in the clock running here in the fourth quarter. They lead by 18. Bryce slides into Cornell territory and goes down at the 46 after a gain of six. As you, Bryce, Yale's leading rusher last year. As the Bulldogs move down the field here and more than likely as the clock is now down to almost nine minutes to play or in position to think again a little further down the road two weeks from now and perhaps Harvard and Yale for the Ivy title. Look and see what these two teams do against each other. You don't want to get premature, but it's already in the minds of a lot of people. That pass complete to Zuby. He has the first down as he goes down to the 35-yard line. Harvard still has to get by a good pen club next week. Yale has to travel to Princeton and play the always potent Tigers with the Garrett brothers. But certainly a chance as we have got an injured Cornell player on the field that will force a stop and play. Certainly if we come back here in two weeks with a one loss situation for both of these football teams, Yale and Harvard, you're going to have a matchup not only in terms of the Ivy League title, but I think a shootout between two great mobile quarterbacks in Tom Yoey and Kelly Ryan. And even though there's good individual defensive people both ways, I don't know how you can stop either one of these guys. I think, as it stands right now, Harvard is the best all-round team that we've seen in the Ivy League offense and defense. And they feel in Cambridge that they should be undefeated at this point going into today's game of Holy Cross, that they have the game won at Cornell and gave it away. And I'm not so sure I don't agree with them. Gary Rinkus was the injured Cornellian who was going off under his own power. The all-Ivy defensive tackle looks like he'd be able to come back. You've got good running with both ball clubs. The advantage might go a little bit to Yale if Troy Jenkins is healthy to provide the blocking and running out of the fullback spot ahead of Mike Stewart. We have seen what Mike Stewart has done. off to Bryce. He has a lot of running room. He has the first down and much more down to the 18-yard line. Yale in the process of putting the final nail in the Cornell coffin. And Peter Noyes, the assistant head coach and defensive coordinator, really can't be disappointed in his unit performance. The offense has put them in terrible position time and time again today. Yeah, the, the, the blame here this afternoon will not rest with the defense. They have really done their job, but Cornell has to figure out a way in their remaining two games and certainly 
as they head into the 88 season to find some way for more productivity out of their offense. Eight minutes to play. Yale leads 21 to three. Taking time off the clock. Up and fumbled the football. And whistle stopped the play. If they called that a non-fumble and that he was down, that's a horrible call by the officials. He was still certainly moving when that ball was fumbled. That's what they've done. Oh, that's a horrible call. Upton was still on his feet, twisting yep. and trying to get ahead for more yardage, and the ball came free. That's a bad quick whistle. Upton was stacked there up he as is. he turned. Oh, that he's ball's still going. well up oh, on his that's, a, that's terrible. That's terrible. Cornell came up with the ball, but sort of typifies the way the day's gone for the big. There's no way he is stopped. No, he's struggling for more yardage. Yale keeps the ball and completes a pass. Chris Troxell was thrown out of bounds and the penalty flag comes down. Jeff Delamalure, a little bit too rough on the tackle of Chris Troxell, the senior from Alpha, New Jersey, who made just his second catch of the year. That's a little bit of frustration. Delamalure was the guy who forced the fumble on the previous play that Cornell should have gotten and didn't. Even still, frustration or not. No need for this. No need for that, you're right. He's five he, yards he, out of bounds. He knew it too, and he threw him down anyway. That pass completion puts Ryan over 250 yards passing on the afternoon. That's his second biggest day of the season. He passed for 274 yards in the Yale win week two over Connecticut. Puts him just about at 1,600 yards on the season. So he's going to break the passing record he set for himself a year ago when he threw for 1,739 yards. From the three, first and goal, Bryce. Touchdown! Kevin Bryce in from three yards out, and that should lock it up for the Bulldogs as they take a 27-3 lead with the extra point upcoming. Kevin Bryce, who was knocked out of the starting lineup by the return to school of Mike Stewart, Getting a chance to play more today with the oh. injury to Troy Jenkins. He wanted the end zone. Mitchell Lee had him in his grasp, and those legs just kept on driving. Dave Derby, the senior from Honolulu, Hawaii, on for the extra point. Trying to make it four for four on the day. He does. And with 7.03 to play in the fourth quarter. It's now a route. Yale 28, Cornell 3. Jack, are you surprised with the struggles of the Cornell offense that We'll talk about that in a moment. Let's look at the touchdown play one more time. Get a better look again at what Sean McDonough was talking about, the determination of Kevin Bryce to get himself into the end zone despite the efforts of Mitchell Lee. 76-yard drive by the Bulldogs. And the first touchdown of the season for Kevin Bryce. go in there and get it up like Timmy LaHerr went in there, and we moved the damn football. We had a tailback and ran like hell that time. Ladies and gentlemen, you're reminded that all Yale parking lots must be cleared within one hour after today's game. Just stay after it. Stay after it. Let's go. A little encouragement there for the Bulldogs on the sideline. They know where they have their sights set. I'm just surprised with Maxie Bond's philosophy during the year, which has almost been revolving quarterbacks. Aaron Samita has started the season at quarterback and led them to the win over Penn. Dave Dassey came on midseason. Larry Delaney played the entire game last week against Bucknell. I'm a little surprised as Dartmouth has overtaken Columbia trying to end that long losing streak. I'm surprised he stayed with Dassey throughout. Well, it, I, I think for part of what you were just hinting at, that you can't keep shuffling quarterbacks in and out and get any kind of continuity. The problems for Maxie have been that not one of those young men has really stepped forward to claim the job, and they've continued to struggle offensively, so you keep trying to find someone who will provide the solution. Dassey is, in their opinion, the best quarterback they have. Byron Dunklin needs to break one. Breaks through to the 37-yard line. Cornell will come out and line up right on the line of scrimmage. No, they'll go into a huddle. No, needs, no reason not to huddle because on the change of possession, they stop the clock. Here's the scoring drive capped by the three-yard touchdown run by Kevin Bryce, which made it 28-3. 6.57 now remaining fourth quarter. Dave 
Stassi with one setback behind him. Ripley in motion. All day for Dassey. Throws underneath to Brickley, trying to get to the sidelines. He picks up a first down before he was tackled by Tyler Johnson, number 52, reserve linebacker and a junior from Grand Junction, Colorado. His ninth tackle of the season. And now Cornell will go without the huddle. You have to wonder how much more successful the Cornell Big Red would have been this season were it not for all of the injuries they've suffered. Dassey throws, complete to Mike Reddy. Near a first down in Yale territory at the 42-yard line, Steve Essick made the tackle. Well, way back at the beginning of the year, in fact, the preseason luncheon, most of the coaches alluded to the same thing, that the teams that are going to be successful this year are the teams that stay the healthiest. Harvard certainly has stayed healthy this year in terms of their key people. Likewise for Yale, for the most part, this is a ball game today is, is the worst Yale has been physically in terms of key personnel, yet they've been able to rise up and, and, and do the job against Cornell. The one uh, tough reality of the Ivy League is that you generally don't have the numbers of gifted athletes as perhaps some of the big 1A programs do, and you don't have the opportunities practice-wise with the uh, spring practice and uh, the realities of classes and labs and all that to, to, to teach and coach your, your younger players, so you don't have the depth. They wind the clock, second and inches for Cornell. Massey throws complete to Brickley, trying to get out of bounds, and he can't. He does have the first down at the 37-yard line. Sam Brickley now with 47 catches on the year, ties him for third. As far as a single-season best in Cornell history is concerned, Bruce Starks caught 47 passes in 1974. Bill Murphy caught 50 in 67, and John Tech and Perry, 61 catches. The Cornell single-season record in 85. Brickley has it again. And he got close to a first down at 28, a gain of about nine. I think the reasons why Yale and Harvard right now sit atop the Ivy League, or will by the conclusion of play today with four and one league marks, is because they have great quarterbacks and a good, strong running game. They've got the combination. Lots of second and third string people in on defense for Yale. Flag goes down to the secondary as the pass falls incomplete short of Mike Barone, but he might have been held in the secondary. 5.47 to play, fourth quarter. Yale, 28, Cornell, 3. Pass interference against the offense. Barone apparently pushed off. Pass interference against Cornell. So instead of second and one, it's about the way the day is going for the Big Red. It'll be second and 16. That'll be a loss of down, third down upcoming for Cornell. It goes from bad to worse for the Big Red. You talk about all the quarterbacks, outstanding group of quarterbacks in the league this year. If you had to pick the best, you'd be hard pressed. Kelly Ryan, Tom Yowie, Jason Garrett, certainly at the top of the list. And if you had to pick the push down award winner as the player of the year in the league, you'd be hard pressed to do that right now as well. That pass incomplete, intended for Brickley. Chris Polstadt, number 61, a reserve defensive end, was out there along with Steve Essick. Well, I don't know, talking about the Bushnell winner. That, that, that will be a time. It'll probably end up being, a, I think, a battle between uh, Kelly Ryan and Tom Yowie, whichever one of the two leads his team to the Ivy Championship. I don't know why they're still running the clock, and now the officials say stop the clock. They lost about 15 seconds there as it tipped down to 526. Should have stopped at about 540. To again get back to some of Cornell's offensive problems, Sean, the other factor today, as you see Bob Verdusco warming up, he'll come into the ball game of the next Yale series, so Kelly Ryan will finish with 19 of 31 for 255 yards on the day and a couple of interceptions. Today, even though you are still eight weeks into the season and coaches will tell you, well, nobody is inexperienced by this point, but Cornell came into the year in terms of 
experience among their skill people having good experience at the two wide receiver spots but virtually no experience anywhere else so you go into the year not knowing exactly how these young men are going to perform you hope they'll do the job but you don't know until they go through the war so to speak and Cornell discovered that in this ball game and a couple of the other losses on the season Brown was another example where they were not able to finish off into the end zone what they were doing between the 20s. Again, the problem concerns the clock, and I would say Yale would be wise to find another clock operator. He's had a couple of problems here today. If George Steinbrenner ran Yale University, they would have had a new clock uh, operator at halftime. We'll be back at the Yale Bowl in just a moment. The Ivy League football game of the week is... Order has been restored. 5.35 now showing on the clock as they tack nine seconds back onto the clock. Fourth down, 16 for Cornell. Over the middle, caught by Mike Redding. He has a first down for Cornell inside the 20 at the 17-yard line. That's complete from Dossie to Reddy. Rutan on the play. Cornell moving the football, but again we point out it really is the second string defense in there for Yale. Pass the end of the flat and incomplete intended for Brickley. Chuck Bray, number 82 on the coverage, the junior from Monroeville, Pennsylvania for Yale. Chuck's dad played for Toronto in the CFL and the New York Giants in the NFL, and his uncle Tony Peters was an all-pro safety for the Washington Redskins. Couple of finals. Brown has defeated Lehigh. And Penn over Lafayette as the Ivy League continues to more than hold its own against competition from outside the league. Tassie got hit as he threw, and it fell incomplete. Tyler Johnson, the man into the backfield for Yale. Simmons also in there. Scott Simmons, a backup linebacker, was putting an awful lot of pressure on. That's Tyler Johnson you are looking at now. He's the guy calling the defensive signals for the Bulldogs here with the second unit out there. Third and 10, 5-17 to play as you see, and Yale leads 28-3. Mike Stewart has scored three touchdowns, all less than three yards. Dassey to the end zone, touchdown! Mike Reddy having a fine afternoon. He scores the first touchdown of the day for the Big Red. And with 5-12 to play, it's now 28-9 with the extra point upcoming, and they will likely go for two, I would think. I would guess so. You never try and say things are done until you can see all the zeros on the time clock. This was a good effort by Mike Reddy in traffic to maintain the concentration and come down with his first touchdown of his collegiate career they are going for two trying to make it 28 to 11 as he throws complete to Brickley he didn't get in guess who hit him Chris Rutan Rutan and Huff all afternoon have come up with big hits for the Yale defense so it's 28 to 9 Yale with 5 12 to play Watch again, number 44, Chris Rutan, the sophomore from Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts. It looked like Brickley was going to get in the end zone, and Rutan said, no, sir. They cross it into the end zone, but that still doesn't make that guy any happier on what has been a tough afternoon for the fifth-year coach. Let's go down to Mike Madden right here. I'm standing here with Dr. Dan Larson. Dr. Larson just got off the phone with the hospital checking up on Cornell's Mark Perlman. Doctor, what do they have to say? Well, Mr. Perlman is neurologically intact. By that, I mean that he has full function of all his arms and legs and isn't paralyzed in any fashion. They're still evaluating his x-rays to make sure there's no fracture and that no other further treatment will be necessary. Okay, well, that's good news. All right, thank so you very far, much. So good. All right, thank you. A great relief to all of us. If you're just tuning in, Mark Perlman of Cornell was taken off the field in a stretcher in the first half. 
after a collision with one of his own players and a Yale player onside kick. Tom O'Brien came up with the ball for Yale. They take over on offense first and 10 at the Cornell 46. Bob Verduzco was warming up and he has come on at quarterback for the Eli's. Bob Verduzco, number 10, sophomore, 5'11", 175 pounds from Santa Cruz, California. Three for six passing this year for 37 yards, one interception, no touchdown. Completed 51% of his passes for Yale's freshman team last year. <laughs> Handoff goes up the middle. Yale has almost an entire second team out there on offense. Here's the scoring drive. While we have a moment, we would like to alert all of the public broadcasting stations on the Ivy League Network and our viewers that we will stay on the air until the conclusion of the game. The game is running long, but we will bring you the game in its entirety. Reggie Sellers, number 25, takes the toss. He's close to a first down, down at the 36-yard line. Sellers, a pre-law major, a sophomore out of Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Getting a chance for some action here this afternoon. It is now a final, and Columbia came close, but not close enough to end their long losing streak. It will continue, and Buddy Tevens has his second win as coach of his alma mater, the Big Green of Dartmouth. That is his first Ivy League win. The previous win came over Davidson. Third and one. Less than four minutes to play now. Aaron Young, sophomore from Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Aaron Young, the carrier for the Eli. Appears to have the first down as he made it down to the 35-yard line. Kelly Ryan, another good afternoon for the senior captain. Only the third Yale quarterback to be a captain here. Yale is at Princeton next week. Ball is free on the field, and again, it goes the way of Yale as it has all day long. Ball came down to Tom Andrus. Back up tight end, number 84 from Orem, Utah. He's another sophomore, and Carp goes. It has to be thinking, boy, we've gotten every break we can today. Well, they had a fumble that they didn't lose because they blew the whistle. That one bounces right to Todd Andrus, and they end up not only maintaining possession, but gaining seven yards on the play. Yale at Princeton next week, and they'll go into that game with a 4-1 and one record in the Ivy League and tied with Harvard. Cornell is going to fall to 3-2 and two in the league. Aaron Young gets the call. Stopped shy of the 25 and therefore shy of a first down by about a yard. Costa Harbillis in on the stop. Look at the Yale ability to drive the football this afternoon. 75, 80, 60, and 76 yards. You dominate the clock and a ball game, and that's why you have a 28-9 lead. Thought we were in a time warp for a moment. Our <laughs> game next week, Penn at Harvard. Reggie Sellers has the first down. And he's out of bounds inside the 20 at the 19-yard line. Reggie Sellers had a pretty amazing year last year for the Yale freshman return three kickoffs for touchdowns. There's our game next week. Penn out of Harvard on all of these PBS stations. Again, we will remind our stations and our viewers along the Ivy League network that we will stay on the air until the conclusion of the game. We realize the game is running long, but we will bring you the game in its entirety. Right now, it's 28 to 9. Yale comfortably on top with 2.05 to play in the fourth quarter. Bob Verduzco at quarterback. He's interested in pursuing investment banking while here at Yale. Sellers, the sophomore from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, gets ahead for a couple more. Reggie Sellers wants to be a lawyer. Came to a good place. Well, 
Yale and Harvard tied for first, four and one. At the end of the day in the Ivy League, Harvard hosting Penn. The game we'll see on the network next week, and then finishing here at Yale. Sizable opposition for both teams before mm -hmm. they can set up. Well, I the, think Harvard has the advantage matchup. next week. I think Yale is going to have a tougher time winning at Princeton than Harvard will at home against Penn. But you're right, they are uh, both going to be tested. Another fumble. Cornell thinks they have this one, but it does not appear that they do. Sellers was the ball carrier, the man who lost it. Brown made the stop for Cornell. And an injured player down on the field for Cornell. Cornell will go home and play Columbia next week and then finish out the season at Princeton against the Tigers. Appears to be Mike Farley injured big redder and it is he's a senior from Farmingville New York this comes with 1 11 to play in the fourth quarter Yale 28 Yale quarterback number seven Cornell nine game Mark that Brubaker. has not really been close for quite some time and Cornell has to be frustrated by its inability to score early when they had many chances three missed field goals hurt but the offense must be faulted for not being able to finish their drives and punch it in Michigan State drilling Purdue. Keep alive their Rose Bowl hopes. That matchup, Penn State and Maryland's always been a good one. Likewise for Indiana, they're still in the hunt for the Rose Bowl title. Mike Farley going off. Came into the game as the second leading tackler this season for Cornell, but apparently that wasn't good enough to keep his starting job because Mitchell Lee, the sophomore, has moved to the head of the depth chart. Been a long day for Bernie De Palma, the Cornell trainer. He's unfortunately been too busy today. Mike Brubaker now at quarterback for Yale, number seven, a junior from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 6'1, 185 pounds. Tosses it deep into the backfield. Lyle Champagne, number five on the carry. They are going deep on the depth chart here in the final stages of the football game. Less than a minute to go. Lyle Champagne's a sophomore from St. Louis, Missouri. Glad to see that Yale is not pulling what we will call a Holy Cross, running it up on the opponent as Holy Cross has done shamefully, I feel, time and time again this season. They've taken a lot of criticism for that from the New England media. Brubaker kept it himself, and that will be the final play of the football game. Well, not perhaps. Fourth down. No, it was fourth down. I apologize for that, and the ball goes back over to Cornell on downs. Cornell takes over on downs. Perhaps wishful thinking on our part, Jack. <laughs> Starting to get a little chilly up here as a little well. Little chilly. The game's out of reach. Let's. Pack it up and head for Cambridge. Next week, Penn and Harvard on the Ivy League football game of the week. One o'clock Eastern time on these PBS stations. Yale on its way to its fifth consecutive victory for Karn Koza. That's Rob Buccini with the ball, number 21 for Cornell. And the clock stops as they move the chains. He has a first down. Out near the 30-yard line at the 27 and a half, seven seconds to go. Let's go down to Mike Madden right now. I just spoke with the doctor again, and more good news on the Mark Perlman front. As as the doctor stated earlier, he's neurologically intact. He's got all the feeling out. The X-rays proved negative, and they're actually bringing him back out here. He, he'll ride the bus back with the team and everything. He's out of the game's over. He's on his way back out here to the field. Thank you very much, Mike. Very good news on which to end the telecast, and a fitting end as another of the great sophomores in that Carm Cosa secondary picks off the final pass. Chris Rutan came up with the interception. That's exactly the way the game ended last week at Dartmouth on a Chris Rutan interception. So Yale now in a tie for first place in the Ivy League with a 4-1 and one league mark. That ties them with Harvard. We'll see the Crimson and Penn next week here on the Ivy League Game of the Week. Until then, for Jack Corrigan and Mike Madden, I'm Sean McDonough. Thanks for watching. So long from New Haven, Connecticut.
The executive producer of the Ivy League Football Game of the Week is Barry Frank. Produced by Chris Carmody. Directed by Bob Lanning. Technical director, Tom Clark. This has been a presentation of Transworld International and the Ivy League Network.